Hello everyone, welcome to the stream. Nice to see you all people here. Sorry for being late as always, but you know the draw by now, I hope. <laughs> just very bad at timing. I was just eating and I always underestimate how long it takes to eat something. It's um, very impressive. But um, as a result, I can stream longer and without getting hungry. So I see this basically as a plus. But yeah, sorry for, uh, you, for keeping you waiting so long. And uh, fantastic to see you here. That's interesting, a person who shares my name, Christian, Christian. Welcome, nice to see you. One Anduin, two Anduins, ah, there he is. Yes, sorry, sorry, people, but what can I say? I'm just bad with time. There's an actual bot for this um, Husky Ask um, moments ago, I would say. No, it was 10 minutes or so. Um, uh, I, co I created a, a bot command for it. I have two bots. I have this uh, the Streamlabs cloud bot and night bot. Uh, I used, originally I used night bot, but I tend to like using um, cloud bot a bit more recently because it has some additional functionality. So both are pretty decent bots. <laughs> Christian, hi, I'm Christian. I'm Christian and Christian, okay. Exactly, we have the new logo because um, how can I bring this up here on the stream without destroying anything? That is a good question, Chad. You might have to... It's still studio mode, I'm not sure. First of all, I need a window, right? Something like this. Then I need to extract the window like this, make it full screen. Then get the production tool somewhere where it uh, favors my stuff. Maybe this here. Why is this activated? That seems strange, but whatever. Window capture, maybe like this, and it's not in the foreground. Genius, Chris. Uh... Community. Oh, I didn't vote myself. Interesting. So why doesn't it work, Chat? Okay, that works. So I hope. Can you see my mouse thing? No. Well, it's not that important. However, um. I would vote for maybe also this. If I do so, we see that 50% um, of the 430 votes, so thank you for all, um, your, all your participation here in this very long uh, blog post here. Oh, this is a really wall of text. But um, yeah, thank you for all um, your support and for your votes and so on. Much, much appreciated. It seems like people seem to like the new logo here, which we can see uh, on top here now. And maybe there will be some fine tuning to the logo still. I just placed it here today as a, not as a surprise, but it seems people really uh, like the new stuff. Like my moderator also had um, something going on with the H part of it and it go went a bit into the G and so it looks also pretty neat. I'm not sure if I want to recreate this, but um, yeah. Um, very interesting. There was also some confusion, but yeah, this is how I did it recently since October. I think I started using this little TP thing. I originally planned to do it in a different font, um, but yeah, the font looked kind of strange. No, it's strange, but the original font looked strange, so I switched through all kinds of fonts, and this looked kind of best. So I used this but uh, I was in, in October when I still covered Rings of Power I hadn't the time to create like a new logo like you need a bit of time and mind for that and stuff like that so I moved it kind of in December and recently I looked a bit into this uh, kind of stuff oh you can't see um, what I'm talking about but yeah this is the old logo that's where I meant you tried out different font styles and it was just something I did very fast because I had very little time at this point and if I remember correctly, we can maybe look in, in a channel when I started using the new logo convention. It started 1st of October was the first video uploaded. It was when, uh, when I um, basically did my recap video to episode um, 6 of Rings of Power. 
as was the first time I think I started with this. Yeah, and 2nd October when I did the analysis stream, I, uh, I also used it already. And from that point on, you can see it in the top corner. I think it's not bad. And now we can see the evolution from this logo to the other from having no one um, before. Uh, it's kind of um, nice to see. So, yeah, that's uh, pretty awesome. And it seems people really like it here. Some already read, um, it looks great. Your logo looks amazing. Thank you, Rosie. Also nice to see you here. So, menu, uh, men flesh was back on the menu. Kind of. I might go earlier because I need a relaxation as always. I'm just uh, quitting my hijab, so hopefully I will be able to stay longer later on. Oh, okay. I hope um, you got a new job and uh, have a um, yeah good transition to the new job. But I can um, I can see why people need a bit of relaxation. Is this even the official correct term? Let me just bring up all the stuff here back up on my main screen. As you can imagine things get more and more difficult when you have a tons of windows opened. Always um Yeah, it seems like it is that. Yeah, definitely after rings of power and all the stuff I also need a bit of relaxation, so that's why I've not very let's maybe consult the Cambridge. Yeah, relaxation. That's how I'm pronounced. Okay, just uh, curious, but it was a it was a tough time because of so much content, little free time. But that now changed a bit. I had a really nice um, few days, few holidays. Met a friend I haven't seen in a long time. Shout out to him. It was really fun. Fortunately, we can't see each other um, not that often because he lives in another country, so that's quite the distance. At least not in person, only video calls and so on. I miss Rings of Power. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting. I think some people don't miss Rings of Power. I also kind of like the, um, not, the not the stress part of it, but um, I like that you have like a, a reason to go online every week and discuss it with the fans and maybe nitpick or... I don't know. D discuss some some of the weird stuff, some of the good stuff. It's it was always very interesting to have the opinions. We got a lot of guests um, in, at this time. I could discuss with uh, the works with. So there was definitely um, something to it, and I always knew what to do next. Like you know, it wasn't it wasn't like what video could I do next? Do I really want to do this video next? was like kind of, okay, I have to do the next video. That, of course, gets a bit boring after a time. But, um, it is, uh, interesting. It was an interesting time, I have to admit. But also kind of, I know, very taxing and sometimes also annoying because some parts of the community were just so negative all the time. And if you have to work with, or if you decide, not I don't have to, I decided to cover the show. And I am also not the hugest fan of all their decisions, to be quite honest, like not even close. Um, it's kind of frustrating when you just are exposed. Like a lot of people just watch the show and move on with their lives. I have, I kind of have to read all the comments all the time. So... It gets on your nerves a little bit if people are just all the time. You know, you don't, you want, I need a bit of positivity in my life, not always this negativity. Everything is so terrible. Why are you covering the show? Oh, <laughs> come on. Some people like it. I still can't really um, say how popular the show was we think about it like the problem is there are a lot of very loud voices um in the world that or in the inter on the internet that don't like the sh 
the show. And I think like a lot of people I knew that are not huge into Lord of the Rings watched it and wondered what's the big deal with the show was kind of okay. And yeah, I guess it's more when uh, you are very into something that you notice maybe its weaknesses. So the show definitely had its problems. Like it won't, I, th I think it won't be, at least season one won't be like um, a show that will stay in, in mind as like the perfect show and as like, like a gigantic impact on how shows are made. Maybe on the technical side of things, but I think less um, on the writing side of things because they're just many weird decisions in this show. I miss uh, not uh, Halbrand, uh, not wanting Halbrand to be spoiler, a certain character, and Waldrick uh, most of all. Fixation the correct term, awesome. You could literally hear him uh, shout, Padme. Yeah, I don't know. There was a tweet from August, so far we've like a month or so. I forgot when the show, not, not a month, like let's say a week or so before the show aired, like 20th August or so. Um, uh, where I'm not sure if I posted the screenshot of um, of Halbrand sitting like behind bars. But um, yeah, that, I al already had the feeling, okay, um, the theory of him being a certain character might be uh, a thing. But yeah, it was relatively clear. I hoped he was not because I didn't like the idea. And with episode six, seven, uh, with seven, it was 100% clear that who he is. Episode six, I, I was like 99% sure. And before that, the hope was still there that it's maybe it is maybe just a red herring or so I love that <laughs> mysterious elvish pencil sarcasm. <laughs> yeah, that was not my favorite part of the show, too, I have to admit. Like, that was a, one of the worst decisions for me. Yeah, that's it. Paul Rome writes it quite well. The fact that he increasingly became obviously this character is what made me increasing, increasingly think he was not. They put so much into telegraphing it. I thought it had to be a misdirection. I agree. Like it was too, uh, it was definitely too obvious for me as well. Like it was too on the nose. If he's like my my thought was if he is Sauron, they just put it on your nose right from the beginning. No, I spoiled it. Amazon can't tell um, how popular it is either. It's a need to know it. I mean, I think Amazon can kind of tell it simply because they know how many people watched it on Amazon Prime and they can see how many people kept Amazon Prime or maybe returning to this. So I think maybe they don't know it in absolute terms, but they have a pretty good idea, I think. And it took quite some time for Amazon to put out some num some numbers in an interview or so to say the show is popular. The question is um, how what, what that means, kind of. Usually, like my, my approach, at least from the gaming industry, is always when I see a game is very successful, usually the developer or publisher does not keep numbers for themselves. They say, look how successful our, our game was. I would say that it's maybe similar with in film and of course TV shows and stuff where you say yeah this show is insanely popular look at these numbers it took them a time to bring those out so I would imagine it's not as bad as some people think but it's probably also not as maybe not as good um as they want to sell or make us believe 
somewhere in the middle, but I, I don't think it was a catastrophe for Amazon. For sure not. Yeah, that is true. Some people really need to chill about Rings of Power. I personally hated the show, but no one should attack people um, who liked it. Yeah. That, I agree with that. Like, it's a bit too... Uh, yeah, sometimes people are a bit annoyed. Can we please stop talking about the, the atrocity? Yeah, we, we stop uh, about talking about it in a moment. <laughs> My mouth was on the floor, yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, I, I simply I can't show you the clip. I mean, you probably have no context to it, but there is, like, um, a, a United States um, commentator, StarCraft commentator, called Atosis, and he played a game called Hearthstone, which is a card game. And the and in this card game, he was, like, one round away from winning the match. And then um, he had, like, all the HP that he hit, po uh, hit points, the other had, like, one or so or three i don't know it was like i've literally one hit away from dying in the next round you have to deal damage to the other deck basically or to the own play of the other deck to win a, a game and um yeah the, the other just pulled like a gigantic combo out of it and won and won the match like in a round he was just sitting silently there with his mouth open for like i don't know a minute or two <laughs> it just was hilarious like that's also was my look on my face um when I had it. I'm not sure if I have the clip. Maybe I can post it uh, if I find it. It was really tough to find. Like somebody posted it and the top comment said, and it, that was the most hilarious comment in this, um, uh, under this YouTube video, was legends say his mouse is still open. <laughs> it was absolutely awesome. But I have unfortunately no idea where I could have saved it. Let me see. Okay, maybe I have it in a playlist. <laughs> I can't, I, I won't show the video here, just watch it um, yourself, but I just posted it in chat, it's kind of hilarious. I found, maybe it's not. Also, shout outs to Atos, he's a fantastic commentator. And, um, yeah, really love him. Though he casts these days mostly StarCraft 1. I think he lived in Korea for a long time. Now lives in Canada. Maybe he's not from the United States. Maybe he's from Canada. I'm not sure. Let me see. Atosis. StarCraft Wiki. Does he say where he's born? I'm not sure. Don't want to... Wait, Liquipedia should have a knowledge of him. No, he's from the United States, it says. Okay. But he's also a legend. Very funny with... Um, with another castle called um, Tasteless. But whatever. Yeah, the writing standpoint is also my biggest concern about the show, I have to I mean. Yeah, I agree with Snef, uh, Snefford, also interesting name. If it would be such a success, they would brag more. Exactly, that's what I mean. They would brag more with it. Yeah, that is true. You can just read the books and get more talking. I just would have wished, like, as a fan, I like when something comes out in my fandom that is for me, and the show, in parts, could have been for me, but failed so miserably at, in some parts that it was kind of frustrating.
No, exactly. For Amazon, the success is in Prime subscriptions. It's a huge investment to bind people to their platform. And yeah, Amazon is also like a weird company, to be fair. Only play um, Sims. Gaming is a gaming gamer. <laughs> yeah, yesterday I played um quite a bunch. Oh, Dairy uh, Dragon, welcome. And um, yesterday I played a bunch of Cyberpunk twenty seventy seven and did some cleanup on Twitch. Cleanup, like I, there were some missions I haven't played yet for strange reasons. And yeah, we also found a new mission that was added recently. That was also fun. I might revisit it and we might experiment a bit with the build we are currently running because it was completely rebalanced in some patches ago. And my save game is still from the time when the game comes out. But we st I still found many, many little bugs in this game. It's kind of interesting sometimes. What is, maybe we should now switch to the Lord of the Rings part because I already got um, friendly reminded um, what it is. Okay, Trixie Bell, <laughs> the, per the person I'm talking about, um, also asked uh, the question. But maybe we start with um, Diary um, Jing. What's the strongest sword in um, Lord of the Rings, I assume you mean? Um, that's a very good question. Strongest sword in Lord of the Rings. It's a bit difficult to, it's a very difficult to answer question because first of all, we might need to establish what strong means. And strong is always like most, like I would assume the strongest sword, that's my, my, my point of view, is the sword that maybe achieved the biggest achievement maybe possible. So, I don't know, it, it, it did something incredible. However, in this case, um, it might be the person behind the sword is more powerful and that makes the sword powerful as well. You know what I mean? In this regard. So from this, yeah, we could make a vote. For, so my top, like the strongest sword, the, if you consider, this, there's a version that Tolkien wrote where later in the, let's call it apocalypse, in the um, Ragnarok or Ragnaroker in the in the equivalent of it in Tolkien's world, basically the um, final battle, the um, Dagor Dagorath. Um, in this battle, there is there are multiple versions of this battle, and Tolkien potentially abandoned this idea to some degree because we don't find it that much. We don't find it mentioned anymore in the Silmarillion, though we find some hints here and there in um, some. Um, 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 texts and in these texts um, in one version of the text Tolkien wrote about this about this final battle the Dagor Dagoras as um, Husky writes in chat um, there is Turin coming back let me see if I have an awesome artwork of Turin because that is amazing who who drew a good Turin chat Turin Turin, I know. That's Ted Naismith. I would use a Ted Naismith. Who, who, draw, who drew a good Turin in my artwork collection? Let me just see. Turin. Okay, that is maybe a good one. Turin and Belek by Jenny Dolphin. I really like that one. So we go with Jenny's. Um, because I also have her selected here. That is... Brum. Also, it could be a bit more reverb here in the room today because I don't have my anti-reverb set up um, here. To, uh, it's here, but I didn't install it because I was busy eating. But yeah, um, here we have Turin. And Turin later, then we have to switch, still switch to Ted Naismith because he has a pretty sick artwork of that, even though it's very, very small, unfortunately. I guess if it's just a sketch he just drew somewhere, but I really like it. So it's a bit not that sharp. It looks it's um like the size was changed a lot. It was it zoomed in a lot. 
So um, yeah, here we have him, and he has his late like he later forges a sword out of the um, black sword um, Anglachel. Anglachel was forged by the by the elf or dark elf as he's sometimes called Eol, and um, yeah, he he made these swords out of a meteor. I assume they are also made out of a meteorite. Like there was a meteorite falling on the ground. There was metal in it. I assume it's not directly explained what he does exactly and extract, but that's my assumption here. And he forges Anglachel. And out later Anglachel is reforged into this sword that we see here Turin holding. And I always have to think which sword is which. There is Durthang and Gurthang. This is Durthang. Dur means black. No, that can't be Gur. Yeah, Dur means black. No, Durs means death. Ang means iron. It's iron of death. Gurthang is the castle. It means Gurs is oppression. No, Gur is dark. It's also a word for dark and Thang is oppression. I can't remember it. But it's, it's very confusing for me. So I hope I said it right. Durthang and Gurthang. I always confuse them. I, I always have to think what, what means what. But yeah, Durthang... It is the other way around. I confused myself. Dur is dark, Thang is oppression, Gurs is death, Ang iron, so iron of death. It's Gur Thang. I don't know why I can't memorize it. It's kind of fascinating. However, this is then Gur Thang, and a Gur Thang um, actually shattered in some versions when Tolk uh, when when he dies, uh, when Turin dies, and so on. But later in the version, coming back now to the Dagor Dagoras. Um, yeah, Gurs is death. Like I, like I said, it always confuses me. <laughs> it's kind of fascinating. And something is wrong with what I just said. Whatever. Um, yeah, he coming back to the Dagor Dagoras. There is one version Tolkien wrote where this Turin here comes back with Gurthang, and he kills Morgos with it. And that is, I think, the most powerful feat a sword in Tolkien's universe could do. Like Morgos, for people uh, wondering, he is the first Dark Lord, the master of um, Sauron. I usually use this fantastic artwork. Of course, I had a 50-50 chance to select the right one. I did not select the right one, but this is the right one. By Kimberly 80, yeah, this is the first Dark Lord the master of Sauron. And he is like the most evil being and even Sauron um, later uses his his evil power um, that Morgos infused into the world for his own dark means, his dark power, his magic and so on. So even though he is bent into the void, he's still kind of there. Just it, like his power is still in the world and he damaged the world. We have the term Arda Mart for it. And however, yes, I would argue in this way, like when we take this version as canon or as a true version or whatever, then of course I would argue that Gurthang is potentially the most powerful sword. However, there are other versions where other people bring him down. Though I think Turin is a pretty common candidate for it. Then, um, yeah, we have a, a second mention here that was already mentioned, and that is um, somebody said my vote is for um, for Ringil by Fifi Trixibel. Ringil is um, the sword of um, Fingolfin, and um, he wounded Morgos um, with it. As a result, you could make an argument saying, yeah, like the sword that can wound Morgos is pretty powerful. Like here we have, you don't see it that well here in this, but you see Morgoth in front with Grond, the hammer of the underworld, and they fight um, in single combat, to which um, Fingolfin challenges Morgoth. And he managed to just dodge all his attacks, like just from a weapons power standpoint. We last, last stream we also read this particular section, and we can read that when he smote the ground with Grond, when Morgoth smote the ground with Grond, like literally craters were that that just sprayed f or exploded kind of um, 
um, happened on the ground, Ma were made on the ground. It smote into the ground. That's a word I'm, I'm losing. And yeah, it's that's very impressive. Like it's, I guess, in as a feat of destruction in of itself, probably more powerful than um, Ringil is. But he managed to not get hit by all the um, swings of Morgos and um, wounded him him seven times. In the end, he still died. But um, like Fingolfin died, uh, died. Spoiler. But yeah, he was saved, and he um, also stung into the um, heel of Morgos, and he would limp from now on. And then, um, one of the um, great eagles, not one, but the king of the great eagles, came and um, scratched Morgos' face and um, saved the body, so it could not be eaten by. Um, werewolves, or I think it was. So, and it was transported away and could be buried properly. There's also t uh, artwork of Ted Nason is somewhere. Let's see if I find it this way. It's strange, I don't find it that way. But um, Ted Nason is also have an artwork of Gondolin. There we can see Turgon on a mountain top. Um, yeah, here it is. We see um, Gondolin in the background, and here we see Turgon. And this is the grave of um, Fingolfin here that he visits from time to time, and is also on this mountain range of the secret of the hidden city, um, Gondolin. Very interesting lore details here on the background. I really like the artwork. Like it's one of my favorite artworks of Ted Mason. We also see the eagle, e one of the eagles that. Um, kind of are close here in the background is another. Um, I don't have like my pointer for, do I have a pointer for it? You have to believe me, um, if you go a little bit up with your view um, from the grave, tiny bit to the right, over the mountaintop there's a, a second eagle. Yeah, seven is also like a holy number, so Tolkien for sure had some Thing here, wounded him seven times. Maeglin bounced seven times off the walls of Gondolin. What's up with all the seven times? So I have to admit, didn't Maeglin only bounce three times? Well, let us look into this. Maybe that's a good opportunity to also read some text to the stuff we are discussing here. But yeah, that would be my number two pick, maybe for powerful swords that we know of. If we just exclude like the bow of Orome or something like that. We can maybe make a vote in a moment what people think like let's exclude Valar weapons for a moment I guess. I think Myros was great. Uh, let me see. Where could we find that? It is the uh, fall of... It should be somewhere here, right? Let me see, Maglor. Oh no, I didn't. Um, I did a terrible mistake. Now I have to scroll back. Epic searching fail here by my side. Not Maglor. I search for Maglin, which is confusing me. Okay, 
Tur sought to rescue Idril from the sack of the city, but Maeglin had laid hands on her and on uh, and on Earendil, and Tur fought with Maeglin on the walls and cast him far out, and his body, as it fell, smote the rocky slopes of Amon Guares thrice, ere it pitched into the flames below. I was not sure how this is pronounced. So let me just look it up and refresh my memory. Air, okay. Air, it pitched into the flames below. Okay. So, yeah, it's not seven times, it's three times. Three is more an elvish thing, that's that for sure. Three is, al three is also like a, a very specific number, um, um, like a biblical number as, as well, that I think it has like a meaning of... Um, not repetitiveness, but if you repeat something three times, it becomes very um, important or very, you know what I mean, um, amplified in a way. I'm not sure what, what the right word is. So is there any other weapon? We have, of course, Narsil. Um, Narsil also a pretty cool weapon. In the Silmarillion as well, we can, we can read I always interpret this specific line um, that it might, like, um, that, that it might maybe got its name in this particular time. It was never mentioned before, to be honest. And uh, here we have a mention about the spear of Gilgalad, um, Aiglos. And we can read, against Aiglos, the spear of Gilgalad none could stand, and the sword of Elendil f um, filled orcs and men with fear, for it shone with the light of the sun and of the moon, and it, wa na it was named Narsil. So, you can argue, at this time, maybe this is, it was named before, still um, past tense here, Narsil, or it was named in this time, Narsil. I always interpret the letter because I find it more interesting that maybe this very important battle of men and elves, like the, the War of the Last Alliance for sure is one of the most, um, how, to, how to put it, like well-known battles, I guess, in, in the history of Middle-earth. And um, yeah, it's like a legend, this legendary battle where we cut off the Ring of Sauron's hand and um, that, that, of course, definitely means something, I guess, in the, in the history. And, yeah, so I could, it would make sense that in this legend also the sword of a king gets its name Narsil or something like this. And that's also how I interpret. So Narsil also um, was able to cut off the ring. So that's also a very powerful deed, to be honest. Um, even in a already destroyed... Um, <laughs> What do you call it? Um, um, status, I guess. But yeah, it, it it broke like it was with the with the hilt shard of Narsil. Isildur cut the ruling ring from the hand of Sauron and took it for his own, as we can read a few lines later in the Silmarillion. So yeah, pretty um, awesome stuff. There was another question. I'm not sure. Is there? Okay, we also have in this context, it's not a sword. The, the, the original question was about swords. We have, of course, as weapons also eyegloss, which is also mentioned here. And um, it says, as I just uh, read against the sword, uh, the eyegloss, the spear of Gilgalad, none could stand, something like that. Now I lost the line and can't find it anymore. <laughs> but yeah. There it is. None could stand in the sort of any, okay, yeah. Yeah, I think Brimby is um, Kili Brimbor. Also, some strange things going on in chat, which I can't really. Um Tell what's going on. I hope um, that um, I wouldn't say this this question is uh, asked, uh, completed. You know what I mean? I answered the question kind of okay. We could make a poll as a... Is there any, like, chat, is there any sort 
you would like to include in this poll. Like currently we have, I mean, the most legendary thoughts I can, can that can come up to my mind at this point. Um, a diary dr a dragon. I think it's pronounced dragon because it's dragon. Like it's gone. Dragon. Yeah. Inter interesting spelling um, thing. Wow, there. Um, yeah, I hope I could answer your question in some shape or form. Gursang on the screen. Uh, wait a moment, I have to find the artwork. There's uh, Gurs Gursang. Let me just do a, a little poll here. Strongest sword in Lotte. What has happened here? In Lotter Universe, something like this. So we have Gorthang, we have Ringil, we have Narsil. Is there any sort um not as a picture, just as a joke because yeah, the sword can also talk. The sword of Turin can talk, and that's kind of interesting. Turin Turamba. Uh, It's kind of interesting um, that um, in this legend of Turin Turamba, and from the blade rang a cold voice in answer, Yeah, I will drink thy blood gladly, that so I may forget the blood of Belek, my master, and the blood of um, Brandir, slain unjustly. I will slay thee swiftly. So, like, Turin also did a lot of unjust things in his life, like slaying Belek and so on and so forth. But it's very interesting. Sting was all Sting is an interesting pick actually, um I have to admit. Glamdring or Chris. I only have four options in the poll, so chat you have to decide. Sting, Glamdring or Chris. Uh, Glamdring is uh, the sword of Gandalf, or Chris the one of later Thorin Oakenshield. Glamdring was also once the sword of um Turgon. Sting is a sword, as you're probably all aware, of Bilbo and later Frodo. I think it is mentioned that um, Anglachel was reforged. There's also Anguriel, that is, a, that is a sister sword of Anglachel. So there are two swords like um, Anglachel, uh, or there's another sword like Anglachel, um, Anguriel. Both are together, but I forgot what happened with um, this. Yeah, th keep in mind that we specifically asked for swords, not for. Um, Yes, and we, we exclude the we we just shrink the as strong as sword in the Lord of the Rings universe. That is also how the original poster or the the person who asked the question in chat um raised it. So I would um go with that. Sting wounded Chilop. That is true. I mean. Glamdring killed, um, like, uh, Gandalf used Glamdring to fight a Balrog. And he killed the Balrog at the end. It's also kind of legendary, I have to admit.
Of course, Mary's Barrow Blade is also powerful and important. Would exclude it here though, because I only have, as said, one option left. I can only make votes, polls in YouTube with um, three, with four options. Three we already have. The one is left. That is true, eye gloss is technically a Naginata type weapon. Jap is a Japanese spear weapon, which is basically a sword on a stick, yes. <laughs> I would still say either Glamdring or Sting. So, Chad, decide between the two. Glamdring or Sting as option three. Gondolin was in a valley, not on a hill. Uh, uh, Gondolin is on a hill in a valley. It's exactly as Ted Naismith um, portrayed it in the, the picture I had a moment ago. I forgot what the hill was called though. But it's, sim it's, it's um, built in the... Um, Inspired from uh, Tyrion. Tyrion is on the hill Tuna. Let me just see. Yeah, the um, um, Tumladen is a hill. No, Tumladen is a no, it's a, it's a valley, right? Is a hill not named for it? That would be surprise. It would actually surprise me if it if it isn't. Yeah, round the villa in Tumladen, upon a hill. No, it's Amon Guares, as somebody wrote, I think also wrote in chat. That is, um, in, in, the, in the Tumladen is the valley and um, Amon Guares is the hill where the city is built upon. Yeah, Tom Laden is a very my mistake. I just switched here um, the names in the text. <laughs> Barrel blade dagger didn't kill Balrog the last time I checked. <laughs> okay, it seems like we can't decide, so we have to um, flip a coin or something. Do I have a chat command for it? An exclamation mark D2. Does it work here, chat? Come on, Nightbot. Okay, that would be Glamdring. I maybe should have said it before, but Glamdring was one, Sting was two. Flip a sword. I, I currently have no swords um, to flip the available. Glamdring killed Balrog, maybe. I write it different. Used to defeat Balrog. I don't have more letters to write it better. Um, 
because technically we don't know how uh, Gandalf, <coughs> excuse me, defeated the Balrog. So that's the poll now. I hope I didn't do any spelling mistakes. There will probably be some in, in it. Whatever. So people can now vote. Very curious. Also, to, the explanation is Ringil definitely wounded Morgoth. We know this is a, like a confirmed legend in the legend, like in the mythology. In um, in um, uh, the 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 Turgon, uh, the Turin thing with uh, Gurthang is a bit more complicated because other versions exist where um, he's not killed by that sword, if I remember correctly. Yeah, exactly. He, something like that is written. Um, he smote him to his ruin um, upon the mountainside or something like this. I prefer me too. Well. The problem is Anglachel is just a mention in the legendary. It's just a name. Like, we don't know what it did. It's... They have a name, so they must be kind of famous. Anguriel... Um, was a sword that Belek later um, had, and then Turin killed him, and then he used it and it was reforged into Gurthang. So, technically, Ang um, Anglachel, we have Anguri uh, Anglachel, not Anguriel. Ang Anglachel becomes Gurthang. Anguriel um, is just like we know it exists. I'm not even sure how often it's mentioned. I think very few times. Anguirel, that's a name. Not Anguriel, Ang, Ang, uh, Anguirel. Interesting. It's mentioned in the Silmarillion. But it's made Anguriel he kept until it was stolen from him by Maiglin, his son. That is what um, we can read in the Silmarillion um, about it. Anguriel. I'm, I need to get the Anguriel out of my name. It's Anguriel. Maybe it's mentioned in Unfinished Tales as well. Nope. Excalibur, I just had to mention. Mithril sword, uh, which makes me think, uh, why did nobody do that? We don't know on, on which, out of which uh, material some of these swords are made. I could imagine that some of them are out of Mithril. I'm not sure if or Mithril was used in, their forging, in the forging process. Keep in mind that Mithril, depending on, you can criticize, but at least Numenor had, according to Unfinished Tales, access to Mithril. They had Mithril in Numenor. Tolkien writes this in like a note um, from in some of the texts in Unfinished Tales. And um, in theory, the ship um, Vingilote was also later um, coated with Mith in Mithril. 
So, and there are some other mentions. So, in theory, Aman should have had Mithril as well. Okay, we should, we ha unfortunately, we have to exclude um, Valar weapons and also um, He-Man. <laughs> but I like, I like the quote that they put in the chat. It's given to Prince Adam by the sorceress of Greyskull as a key to transforming into He-Man, the most powerful man in the universe. I mean, that's kind of a statement in of itself, I have to admit. Quick pun that was funnier than me. Uh, sometimes the geography stuff is really. Can't kill the Witch King though. Is, great, uh, is Skeletor the Witch King? <laughs> is his name Skeletor? Something like this, right? I mean, Gorsang, to be fair also killed a dragon like it killed not only some of the dragons it killed the father of dragons um, glaurung it's maybe also a good point that joe is making so i have to admit killing a pyrog or a dragon is in my at least in my head on a very similar scale and inter it's very interesting if, if you look into the story of um, how he kills um he, he kind of sneaks under the belly and um, does this, and um, the uh, Folsung um, mythology from the Norse mythology um, is very similar to that if you think about it. It's kind of interesting. But yeah, Norse mythology is also very strange at times, but quite, quite interesting how many parallels there are. Let us see. Gorsang currently sitting on 53%. Ringil is 29. I mean, wounding Morgos, in my opinion, is also quite impressive. Like, there's not, not many weapons that could have said this. There's also Angrist, which is a, um, which is a knife that um, Beren uh, used to um, get out one of the Silmarilli from the crown of Morgos. But, um, yeah, it, it snapped doing so. Which is <laughs> like it's kind of interesting that it's a um, it's a second weapon that snaps like Narsil snaps um, and um, Angrist also both were made by the dwarven smith Telchar interestingly so it's an interesting connection that both of them have I guess that is true it's more strategy from Turin than power of the blade I I would agree on that. Didn't a lot of Balrogs and dragons fall in Gondolin? Uh, we don't know what... You have to consider that um, in very early versions, when, like, the story of Gondolin, the fall of Gondolin, is a story Tolkien... It's one of the oldest stories Tolkien wrote. It's from 1916 or something. It's one of the oldest texts he wrote. And back... Uh, also, Priscilla, I wish you have a good one. Thank you for staying so long. Um... Relaxation? No, that was not the word what I'm looking for. Um, exactly. Back in the day, the dragons and balrogs were less powerful. Especially the balrogs were less powerful. There were like armies of them, and so as a result, many died in Gondolin. Later, um, Tolkien just reduced the number to just like I don't know something between five or and seven or something like that, and. Um, they became much, much more powerful, like an army each of their own. And in this version, I think only two or three Balrogs died in um, Gondolin then. And two very powerful elven warriors, which also died in the process, process of fighting those. But you always have to... like It's a bit complicated if you have to have this very old concept story and have to, you have to elevate it to, you know, the later idea of Balrogs being more powerful. Oh, Jonas, nice to see you here. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Okay. It was a very relaxing time. I should have worked more on um, my next law video, I have to admit. But, um, yeah, I... 
I could motivate myself in in the later Christmas time too much, so I decided to just make some streams here and there and play a bunch of games. But yeah, I was also streaming quite a bit on Twitch recently. Not quite a bit, but yeah, I had, we had a few I had a few streams there because I usually <laughs> I usually <laughs> had um. Like if I if I play a single player game often, I think what I could I could simply just stream it. You know why not? Maybe somebody's in chat and finds it interesting. But usually, um, my Twitch streams are very lonely. I have to admit, there's simply too much competition um, in the Twitch game, and I think my Twitch streams are not that entertaining as well. But whatever. Um, I had to laugh, by the way, because um, Husky f said, Damn, Telkar, uh, Telkar really needs to step up his missing game. His weapons always break at the worst moment. <laughs> Biorocks aren't that hard um, to kill. Exelion killed one with his head. That is true. Uh, he actually drowned it and himself. She's always working hard. Uh, I wouldn't. I, I. I would like to agree, but it's unfortunately not true. I could work definitely harder. The only time I really worked hard this year was definitely before and during the time Rings of Power release. That is when I worked really, really a lot, like a lot, a lot, too much. Sounds good. Yeah, it was um, a lot of fun yesterday. We played a bit of cyberpunk because I had like a bunch of side missions that I didn't do. And now we did at least those I want to do. All that is now need to, um, left for me is may wait for the DLC of Cyberpunk 2077 and also to maybe refine my build a little bit. Uh, that's also good by Paul um, Rome. To be fair, it was Shelob's great strength that m uh, made the blade pierce her. A sharp rock might have worked the f uh, in the right circumstances. Though at, you have at least to give credit to um, Sting that it didn't break in the process or so. <laughs> All that is left now is to play Skyrim. Yeah, good old Skyrim. But some also somebody wrote um, earlier in chat something about Cyberpunk. Like it was his ninth playthrough or something like that. I read this, but I lost. I, I um, ignored a lot of messages. Oh, Christian! It, well, question it was. I already did my ninth run in Cyberpunk. I'm totally in love with this universe. I didn't encounter lots of bugs. These runs though, but yeah, back to Lord Rings now. Ninth run, yeah, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I don't do that many runs in the game, but sometimes I just start the game and um, drive around and look at in with with ray tracing stuff. It looks so beautiful the game. And now uh, my total play time amped up to I don't know three hundred or something hours. <laughs> it's just kind of ridiculous, but yeah, it's kind of. I'm also I really like the um, how it's designed, like the visuals and so on. It can definitely improve a few things, but still great. Though the release version was still very unfortunate state, should not have released like this. But that's a different topic here. I think it's a uh, the point of Excellion's uh, helmet delivered um, the lethal wound falling into the fountain was just extra. I think. I think his intention was to drown the Balrog um, in the in the fountain, and he drowned as well. But yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Thanks, I've been wrong with my comments. That's also a good point. Gursan <laughs> can't be the best sword because it killed Bele. <laughs> No, we won't do singing here.
Almachil killed Belek, not Gursang. Yeah, that's of course a subtle difference. I'm also curious if Anguriel is mentioned somewhere else. Let me see if I can get my book here. Anguirel. Oh, I said it wrong again. Angband. I have like the index of history of Middle Earth. Let me see if it is mentioned there somewhere. Angrist. Angrod. No, it's not mentioned in history of Middle Earth. Isn't it interesting there are 12 books and it's not mentioned once? But like I said, it's just like a side note. Like it's just Tolkien wrote somewhere. Yeah, there's also a sister sword to Anguriel. Ang uh, Ang Anguirel. Or mate sword, as Tolkien um, phrases it here. But it's mate sword he kept until it was stolen from him by Maeglin, his son. We can also read, um, and that smith was Eol the Dark Elf, who took um, Arithel, Turgon's sister, to wife. He gave Anglachel to Thingol as fee, which he begrudged for, uh, which he begrudged for leave to, uh, for leave to dwell in an Elmos. But it's made Anguriel he kept until it was stolen from him by Maeglin his son. Interesting that Thingol got the sword as a fee. But Thingol turned the hilt of Anglachel towards Belek. Melian looked um, at the blade and she said, There is malice in the sword. The dark heart of the smith still dwells in it. It will not love the hand it serves, neither will it abide. With you along. So, in in a way, the the reason, even though we have Gursang as maybe the strongest sword here because of the strongest deeds you could potentially do with it, the problem with the sword is, as Melian phrases, if, um, yeah, phrases it here, that it definitely has malice in it, and it usually ends not well for the wearer of it. And there's only like a little redemption arc for the sword in the uh, Dargor Dagoras, but only in one version. So it's definitely not a sword. I, I would I would definitely choose uh, Ringil over Gursang, if I'm honest. Interestingly, uh, Narsil was um, the uh, least picked sword, which I find, I wouldn't say surprising because there are very strong picks in this list. Like Glamdring is a very impressive sword as well. But yeah. So there was a very long um, little extra tour regarding the sword. I might end the poll now. Do you think Ungoliant was one of the nameless things? Uh, no, I don't think so because she had a name. Like it would be strange to name a nameless thing, right? She was Ungoliant. We don't know what she is exactly. And the nameless things are kind of strange. Yeah, that's the only mention. Without this sentence, I think Ang Anguirel was not even um, mentioned anywhere else. That's, I think the only mention of that sword, it is mentioned in the index of um, the Silmarillion, but the index was not written by Tolkien. That's basically it for Angu uh, Anguirel.
Uh, I have a question. When were dragons made? Because the first use of them is in the War of Ras, but there's uh, inscriptions on the walls of dragons before uh, the War of Ras. The first mentioned, I think, is definitely a. Um, I forgot which which it was. It, I think it was the. Um, but you are right. The dragons were potentially made um, uh, earlier. Then the War of Wrath, for sure, but also after, like in the years of the sun already, because I think it was the um, um, the uh, Dagor Bragolach, the Battle of Sudden Flame, where Glaurung came forth when he was still young. And he is like the first dragon, I assume, that was created, and uh, Morgoth was angry that he showed himself. And I think we can also read that he wasn't as strong yet, and that his um, his scales weren't as hard yet, something like that. And um, yeah, he he got um, thrown back, and uh, Morgos was kind of angry that Gorthang, uh, not Gorthang, Glaurung. <laughs> Today I have it with names, I just confuse them all the time. Uh, Glaurung, the father of dragons, showed himself so early, so his enemies now knew, oh, this guy has dragons. That um, he was not very happy about. I'm not sure if there's any mention of earlier dragons in Tolkien's writings. I mean, there are earlier writings with dragons, like the Fall of Gondolin, as said, was written 1916, but later it happens in the war, uh, in close to the War of Wrath, a few decades earlier. And um, so there are also dragons are mentioned. I think even there's a dragon in some ver version mentioned that transports Balrogs or something. It's kind of interesting to see, but as said, Tolkien just toned it down a bit with Balrogs and dragons later in the later versions and so on and so forth, and Christopher Tolkien tried to make use of that. Also, maybe I should switch here my fantastic imagery again. Do we have a picture of a dragon? I don't have many good dragon pictures, unfortunately. I have uh, one of uh, Jenny Dolphin. Pretty nice. Now, yeah, kill switch also welcome. Um, Phrase it well. Uh, the question was, do you think Ungoliant was once a nameless thing? So well, we answered that, I think. Um, I see Ungoliant as a sort of um, impersonation of shadow or of, of darkness, like a black hole. That's kind of how I imagine this entity. Now, Goldberry is um, like Tom Bombadil, like a spirit of a certain aspect of the world, like a spirit, like some spirit being. A nature spirit in a way. Tom Bombadil maybe like I like the theory, I mentioned it in my video as well, about Tom Bombadil, um the like the what do you call it, manifestation of the music of the Ainur in some way, or like a part of it. That's definitely a good idea and on a like a Tolkien writes he is the spirit of the English um, countryside. He writes it in, in letter 19 or something, very early on. Also, very old concept of Tolkien. No, nameless things is written um, not in capital letters, so they are just described as nameless things. But And this stick to us as fans who need to talk about these things, but they don't have a name. Let me just switch to Lord of the Rings really quick. There we have the nameless things. The nameless things are really strange. I saw some uh, Tolkien um, channel made a video about them. And uh, it was called like, um, are the nameless things older than Sauron or something like that. It was only eight minutes long. I think it was by a German Tolkien channel. Um, Mütten um, aus Mittelerde, I think, made a video about them. I haven't seen it yet, but I would be very curious what these people um, 
have to say about it because um, I never did much research on the name of things. Uh, but let me just post the quote in chat so you can see. This is how it's in my digital version of um, the book. You see nameless things there is, um, yeah, there is um, a space missing because of the um, new line, but whatever, uh, just ignore it. But you see nameless things is not written in capital letters. So it's not their name, it's just how it is. Same with Fell Beasts, by the way. It's also not written in capital letters, the winged steeds of um, Nazgul. But it's interesting uh, what he, we discussed this last stream as well, I think. It's kind of funny how we always come back to the same topics, but I guess there are the edge cases which are always very interesting. Even Sauron knows them not. They are older than he, Tolkien writes here, which is strange because technically they can't be older than Sauron. Sauron is older than the world itself and probably was created by Eru with the other spirit beings in a time where there was no time. So saying that somebody is older makes very little sense, I guess. What is possible, though, is that the nameless things, and that is maybe what Tolkien means here, or there are two, possi two possible interpretations of this sentence, in my opinion. Either Gandalf means the Nameless things existed long, even before Sauron, or um, Myron, as he was called before, according to Parma il de Lamberon, issue 17, that, um, like, he was, Sauron was once a Maya of Aule, same as Saruman, or he, I guess, still is, but complicated topic. And, yeah, um, maybe when, the, when he was still Myron, the nameless things already existed in the world. You know what I mean? Like, they are older than the form Sauron exists, or that well, they are longer. No, how to how, how can I phrase this correctly? Like they existed before Myron became Sauron, so they are older than Sauron, if you know what I mean. That is one interpretation of the sentence, or they are simply longer on Arda than um the spirit being Sauron slash Myron is on Arda. That is also definitely a possibility that Sauron maybe came a bit later to the world and they already existed in a very early state of the world and they are older than him and so on and so forth. So that is a very interesting detail because the only way for these nameless things, and we don't know how they look, there's no description of them, Far, far below the deepest delvings of the dwarf, the world is not by nameless things. The, the, the description that it's not implies that they might be physical beings. Like, if I understand the word, I hope I pronounce it right, at least. But I see the, I assume the G is silent. So that basically they are eating the, you know, the, the world, the earth below or something, like worms. So I would, I definitely get like an impression of some weird being with, with some kind of maw or so that can gnaw on the world. It's no, okay, not gnaw. <laughs> Sorry for that. Is it really? Is it the United? Maybe the United States? No. Ah, the United States people say gnaw, and the British people say no. Okay. Thank you, English language, for confusing me further. But you know what I mean, at least. And interestingly, if they are physical beings, then they can't be older than Sauron, who is a spirit being who existed before the world of physical beings existed. And there was even a time, which we can also read in the Silmarillion. Oh boy, I, I won't find it though. Oh, that will be really difficult. I think I found it. Um, but this condition Iluvatar made, or it is the necessity of their love, that their power should thenceforward, I hope I pronounce this right, be constrained and bounded in the world, so in Arda, to be within it forever until it is complete, so that they are its life and it is theirs. 
and therefore they are named the Valar, the powers of the world. So these spirit beings, the condition that they could kind of get the administration of the world is that they are bound to the world and contained therein forever. That is a, a prerequisite for, for them becoming the, the powers of the world, if that makes sense. And as such, you could argue there was, it was a time where they were not bound to the world, had no physical form and so on and so forth. So it's kind of interesting in this context to see what Tolkien means with nameless things when they are physical beings. Otherwise, I would assume that these nameless things are also kind of spirit beings that took a physical form. But if that is the case, it is strange that they could be older than Sauron. That is, like I said, it's, it's a really strange statement. It's a very interesting metaphysical one. But it's, it gives, it makes you think, you know what I mean? It's fascinating. Is Tom Bombadil or Treebeard eldest being? Treebeard can't be um, that old because Treebeard is younger than the dwarves because the ends were created as an answer to the dwarves. At least Yavanna knew what dwarves would be doing when they were set into the world and then later they were created so they can't be older. I would So I would argue that Tom Bombadil is older than Treebeard. That's a good question. Do you think Gandalf went to Moria to get rid of the Balrog? Like he sent uh, Bilbo and the dwarves to get rid of Smaug? Maybe. Like in the book, Gandalf wants it to go um, through Moria for people wondering, maybe have only seen the films. In the films, Gandalf is against going through Moria, I think. In the book, he wants to go through Moria himself. So it, it might be his intention to to, to have this conflict. I think it maybe was kind of his fate as well. And it was like a very important step in the world. Just imagine you had like a powerful Balrog also in this very complicated story um, or this network of powers uh, during the time of Lord of the Rings. You had, you had Saruman, you had Sauron, you had the forces of good and the free people Gun with, the East with the help of the Easter, at least of Gandalf. And um, then you had also, in addition, you had the elves and in addition the, the Balrog somewhere in between. That, that would be a very complicated mess, I think. And so taking a Balrog out of the equation was definitely very important. So I think it was either kind of his fate to do this. I'm not sure if he really wanted to do this though himself, but, himself, but who knows. Very interesting topic though. Rings of Power is the best show ever. I wouldn't go that far, but I can definitely see that people kind of liked it. And I heard some people expressing their um, liking for the show. For me, there was just too much stuff I didn't like, though there was also a lot of stuff I really liked. I just, and I still see potential in the show and hope it gets better next season with some of its problems. But yeah, currently it's for me personally not the best show ever. Not sure what I would consider the best show ever, though. But I don't know. Probably Star Trek The Next Generation is the best show ever for me, but yeah. But Morgos was like the root of every evil because he was the one who um, corrupted the music, right? Shouldn't he then predate Ungoliant? It's possible that he predates Ungoliant. It's hard to tell, to be honest. I guess a very extremely metaphysical question, very hard to answer for me. Um, you could argue maybe Goliant was created due to the dissonance that Morgos put into the music of the Ainur. It is a, definitely a possible interpretation of that. I'm not sure if that is the case. Or, like, in a way, where, light is, where there's light, there's always a shadow, um, one says. So maybe she is like. A product of, of the balance between light and dark that Eru potentially put intentionally in his world as we see it also in our world. As I said, it's very difficult to tell. There are definitely multiple interpretations for this.
Nameless things um, get names after they do something. A nameless thing becomes the watch on the water after it showed So Yeah, that's an interesting point that you make there. Were there chickens on Middle Earth? If so, which one was the greatest of them all? That's a good question. I think, yes, there could be a mention of chickens somewhere. The problem is Tolkien knew uh, probably a billion words for chicken, so he probably... I mean, <laughs> in a weird way, there's also... Um, um, in an old version, there's also like um, express train or something mentioned. Um, we have like um, artwork with a with 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 a with a what do you call it? The the switch clock, and also um, German barometer, something like that. We also see an illustration of Tolkien from for Hobbiton. So there's all kind of weird stuff in one. F in, in in one very old manuscript of the Hobbit, he mentions China. So, <laughs> and Christmas. There are a lot of things. So I can definitely see that chickens are part of the world. But maybe somebody knows in chat. Currently, I have no chicken quote um available for me. Maybe you find something like I don't know rooster or whatever. But I don't know all the chicken animal terms in English. No idea. And uh, the most powerful of them all, I'm not sure if there's one particular mention, so it will be difficult to determine which one is the most powerful, but I um it's the most serious answer I can give you. But good question, very funny. Um it's stated in the Darkening of Valley you know, that Melkor is said to have corrupted Ungolians, so there are no other explanations. I assume. Okay, that's a discussion. I think it's more me metaphysical. Thank you for answering. No problem, man. I hope that it was somewhat satisfying. We made Morgoth scream in pain louder than uh, any sound in the world. I've never... Mm -hmm. Need to get to where chat is. One chicken to rule them all. Exactly. My thoughts on Goliant are evolving. I'd always considered her the polar opposite of Bombadil with their um, unexplained origins, but the obscure and nameless things complicate um, that neat duality. I mean, it's not clear if the nameless things are actually spirit beings as well. It could indicate that they are, that's like another possible interpretation, but that would be strange. Especially, why would Sauron not know them then? But, I don't know. Yeah, bot invasion. Oh, we purged it. <laughs> the army of the dead would be the greatest chickens. It was like another question by somebody. <laughs> Maybe they are like a demo version of the song until the studio version was made. But the demo version existed together with the studio version now in the same world. <laughs> it's an interesting way of seeing it.
It needs space first to create time because time um, emanates from space. Uh, time is movement in space. That is true. I'm not sure how far um, this was thought through. Like in a way, I think this is only true in a world where nothing can exist without a physical form though, because I think a physical form would need space. But I, let's assume there would be a form of the world in existence that would have no physical matter and was just like basically, I don't know, compressed ideas that became beings, something like that. Because I think the Ainur are basically the ideas of Eru and they became things. And as such, you could argue that maybe also... Well, the question is, what would what, what, um, time need it for this? That's the biggest question. But you could maybe imagine that... I could maybe imagine in a strange way having just moments without space like without there's a change in space that is basically the description of time so this would be kind of a different way of thinking about time if i'm honest but it probably goes a bit but i would i would agree basically space would not exist without time in from our world's perspective that's definitely that i can definitely see what you mean there like basically Time is a concept where what you have in space in the in an in like a set state in space that changes to another one and this diff this difference if you per if you perceive only the furthest or the uh, specific one you you have like movement in time it's very difficult for me to express um, complicated stuff like this in English. Yeah, that's true. Morgos, of course, needed um, his Balrogs to have a chance against Ungolian, though maybe she surprised him. You always have to, I guess, could argue, like, Morgos was in, his, in her cloud or in her web of darkness already. And so she had, in German, would say, Heimvorteil. <laughs> Home advantage, if that is even a word in English in sports or so. Interesting. Valaquenta. Ainur entered into the world at the beginning of time. Interestingly, the, the place where Eru lives are also called the Timeless Halls, if I remember correctly. Yeah, for the great music had been but the growth and flowering of thought in the timeless halls. And the timeless halls probably don't have time. And the vision only a foreshowing, but now they had entered uh, in it at the beginning of time, and the Valar perceived that the world had been but um, foreshadowed and foresung, and they must achieve it. So began the great labors in uh, wastes unmeasured and unexplored and in ages uncounted and forgotten until the deeps of time in the midst of the vast halls of air. There came to be that hour and that place where was made the habitation of the children of Iluvatar. And in this work the chief part was taken by Manwe and Aule and Ulmo, but Melkor too was there from the first, and he meddled in all that was done, turning it, if he might to his own desires and purposes, and he kindled great fires. Yeah, that's true. In addition, the Ungoliant also 
like consuming the two trees also empowered her greatly. I I interpret is uh, what what we can read about as well like this. I'm not sure how explicitly it's mentioned though. I wonder if uh, Tolkien uh, knew something of Einstein's relativity uh, might have uh, affected his ideas of time. It definitely has potential, and as a scholar, he might, uh, for sure, has heard of it because it was kind of a big deal back in the uh, science world, I guess. It still is today. However, uh, you have to keep in mind that Tolkien's ideas are, I guess, often when it comes to stuff like this, um, very um bound to like mythology to legends and also to the bible and to christianity so that's always a thing to consider <laughs> Legolas and Mother is the name. Wow. What did I like about the Rings of Power? Like, uh, even though I promised um, we sh that we don't talk, no, I didn't promise it, but I said we would continue to Lord of the Rings um, soon, which we did. Um, things I liked, like I said, the um, I liked the uh, Durin and Elrond section quite a lot. I also thought it was not as terribly written as some of the other stuff, so that was um, definitely help uh, helpful. I like definitely um, what the actors did. I felt like most of them did a pretty good job. I liked uh, specifically the um, dialogue between Galadriel and Adar. I think that was pretty good, and something we have like exploring the metaphysical world of Tolkien, even though it was just a small moment, but like this. We have never seen in an adaption as well. And like um, Dan, aka um, Voice of Geekdom, said, um, his inner Tolkien fan was sitting there nodding all the time. And yeah, that's, that's definitely a statement I could behind. Like, I, I really um, kind of liked. Also, I don't know, the, the, for example, the, the beginning, the scene with the two, like seeing the two trees of Valinor in this quality, like you definitely see it's a, it's a show with a lot of budget. And seeing the two trees of Valinor was a pretty, pretty nice moment in the show and could make use uh, of that. And I kind of liked all... I expected before the show started that I wouldn't, for example, like the whole um, Hobbit Harfoot stuff and I liked it more in the end than I admitted because it also, for the most part, worked better than a lot of other stuff. I liked the set pieces and so on, most of the part. Sure, there's some room for improvement here and there, but um, still kind of nice to see. I think my biggest problem with the show is definitely many many writing decisions they did. Everything else is kind of okay at or even good to very good I would say. Unfortunately the actor of Adar won't return um, for season 2 so very unfortunate. He's such a gifted actor. But yeah, let's return to Lord of the Rings because, uh, as I said, <laughs> you shall not spam. Yeah, currently bots kind of work bad. I have to say there are not that many bots um, compared to previously. Just got interesting and back to uh, Rings of Power again. Sorry, pumpkin. <laughs> If Eru moving constantly at the speed of light, his time would um, stop at zero, so he lives in a timeless zone. I mean, that is. That's a, that's a very complicated case because the time only stops from the perspective of an, another observer. 
that observes another uh, what is the English word for Bezug system framework reference system something like that So the question is, what does time actually stop? In a way, like I said, only from the perception of somebody else, not of his own perception, if that makes sense. But maybe it would. That's a complicated edge case. I guess, well, it's, it's only when it's it becomes complicated in this case simply because uh, we we get we approximate when we approximate the speed of light we get into the realm of the singularity so a not defined uh, path of um, the equations of Ein of Einstein. Speaking of bots, like it's always funny when you say bots and suddenly they come out of nowhere. You have to like um, frame of reference, system of reference, something like that. Uh, Happy Christmas and all, uh, all. I've been reading the books again and I've always wondered if Sam got the chance to tell uh, Van Gorn about um, the story of his cousin seeing the tree, uh, the tree walking in the Shire. That's a really good question because I, ex I know exactly what you mean because it's a fascinating detail. There was like, um, I think it was at the beginning. Oh, this is still a prologue. It is at the beginning of um, Lord of Rings, a long expected party. Uh, all right, said Sam, laughing with the rest, but what about these tree men, these giants, as you might call them? They do say that one bigger than a tree was seen up away beyond the Norse moors not long back. Who's they? My cousin Hell, for one. He works for Mr. Boffin at Overhill and goes up um, to the Norse farthing for, for the hunting. He saw one. So that's... um. The mention basically of walking trees there, which is kind of interesting. I'm not sure if he ever had the chance to tell um, Treebeard about it. it. Would be interesting to know. But um, to my knowledge, no, they, he never told him or had the chance. But am <laughs> I from Teufel spricht? Yeah, exactly. Also, happy Christmas uh, to you and um, yeah. Fantastic slide into the new year. Guten Rutsch ins Neue, as people say in Germany. Also, to, not only you, to all the people here in chat. I hope you had good uh, Christmas days. Perhaps Eru could not create the universe he wanted because um, thoughts which were Melkor still dwelt in his head and he could not eliminate them himself. <laughs> Make a video. Um, whatever, I'll read it in a moment. So he externalized his thoughts as um, the Valar to let the rest of them. Uh, to, the rest of them get rid of Melkor, so he could eventually be a second music with uh, without Discord. That's an interesting idea. But I think, in a way, it's similar to our world. That um, sometimes, like I said, where light, the, where light, there needs to be shadow. Like, I think, 
and maybe just just my interpretation that that even though there is a lot of fate um, in Tolkien's universe, an honest decision is very important. That um, the beings have a free will and can kind of decide what they want to do. And if you have if you create a world where this is a basic concept, you need the institution of um, and it's institution of another option to decide for, in this case, Melkor. So I think um, in this universe, um, it must be done. And maybe the the goal is to kind of overcome this other option, like the evil, if you want to put it in that way. And then the world is recreated without it. But people have the experience from their previous existence of what it means to be um, exposed to that evil. Like, it's like a distant memory um, of it, but they overcame it at, at some point. I think that is kind of the whole point of of all the create the new um, world stuff. So it will never come again because it is now extinct and not part of the new world anymore, but um, still the knowledge of it is still there but now people can handle it because they have learned to do that but as I said that's very metaphysically make a video about the theory of relativity with some German thrown in that might be a funny video to be honest but yeah my my uh, my my physics are a bit rusty to be honest That's an interesting question by Mr. Man, also a very cool name. Um, hello, Mr. Man. <laughs> um, what, uh, what was up with Bjorn's animals? They were unusually dexterous and intelligent. Are all animals intelligent in this sort of way in Tolkien's mythos? Or was it something, um, was it something, to, was it something to do with Bjorn himself? That's a really good question. The problem is I have no good answer for your question, unfortunately. I wish I had. Like, I can maybe answer it kind of from a metaphysical standpoint. Because Beorn is like mostly a character we know from The Hobbit. And The Hobbit is a very special book. Like, it's kind of the special case of the Lord of Rings universe. Especially in the form that it is definitely, like, its, it's basic character of this book is more of a fairy tale story than Lord of the Rings in a way. Like, originally Tolkien wanted to wrote a story with his children in mind, and The Hobbit was created. At the time he wrote The Hobbit, the whole idea of the One Ring and so on um, didn't even exist. So the metaphysical, like the mythological world, um, the Silmarillion, already existed, at least in parts. And maybe there was a very, very short time in Tolkien's life, it's just theory, that Tolkien wanted to make the Hobbit play inside this mythological world, inside the Silmarillion world, maybe even in the First Age. Because we have, for example, the Elven King, and there are some similarities, distant similarities, to um, Thingol. Though he's very different, of course, in Thingol in many ways as well. But, um, so, I assume Tolkien said, okay, my mythology isn't even far enough to do this, so I just borrow some names. And that is how Gondolin, how Elrond, and so on, um, became part of his world, of, of, the, of the Hobbit book, by just simply borrowing names. And Golfimbol, for example, in a very early manuscript, is also called um, Fingolfin, which is a very fascinating detail. See my latest um, Who is Elrond video for more information. So from this perspective, um, the the whole description of animals and so on, I would assume is far less set into stone during the time he wrote The Hobbit. As a result, they seem more intelligent and more dexterous and potentially more like mythological or fairy tale beings at times. And that is why they behave, especially around Beorn, um, in this... Uh, <laughs> in this... Uh, in this book. And so we have The Hobbit sticking out a little bit with also some mentions of wereworms. We have these stone giants throwing stones at each other. 
which could also be like a thunderstorm and maybe some landslides or so. We discussed this last um, stream, by the way, which is kind of interesting that we come back to this topic. But the whole book feels more like this. And I think when he started writing The Lord of the Rings, his vision, like he wanted to have, he wanted that Lord of the Rings is connected to the Silmarillion. And then he started to vary with a lot of work to um, bring it into the world um, itself. Um, Brothers of Crin, thank you for staying so long. Um, have a nice rest and a nice rest of the evening or late afternoon for you, I guess. Um, all the best to you and thank you for staying. As always, um, the Brothers of Crin is also a, a Tolkien creator who does videos here on YouTube. Check his channel if you have the time. Shoutouts to him. So thank you for staying and um, uh, staying a while and listen. But yeah, return to my return to my thought. Then the world was needed to become a bit more maybe less fairy tale-ish in the lord of the rings and more consistent and the fairy tale-ish and the mythological stuff is more in the background of lord of the rings like in the background story in the past because if we look at the fourth age the elves are leaving middle earth and this is kind of a way how the world becomes less mythological the elves as very mythological beings um also go somewhere else and leave the world and now men have to and Tolkien had the idea that the world slowly develops into the world we know today in earth basically and as such um, it is quite interesting to to see that the world in Lord of Rings becomes less and less mythological and so uh, you could argue that also the idea of these um, yeah intelligent um, animals and this mythological fairy tale beings is reduced further and further. So that would be my meta explanation of why this might be the case. I'm not sure if there's a good explanation for it inside the world. But a very good question. I hope it kind of answers uh, what you asked. Okay, that is interesting. The rope walk uh, in Tidefield. No, I've never looked that up. Probably um, an interesting uh, term of uh, research, I guess. The rope walk of Tidefield. Very interesting. No, I never looked um, into this. Very interesting um, detail. Thank you for uh, <laughs> your extensive answer. No problem, man. I always feel a bit bad when I can't give you like a really good answer, more like some of this meta answer or whatever. It's a rope production line, yeah. Seems like it's very interesting. We have dwarves with colored beards and uh, capes in the Hobbit as well. That is true. There's an article if you Google special relativity in Mid Middle Earth. Next video idea. Okay, <laughs> this might be interesting. Uh, where does the magic... Suriel asks, where does the magic of, wi uh, of the Witch King hail from? Did he learn it as a mortal? What uh, is it in the written word? So there's not mm, there's not much about um, this. There's only one particular quote that we um, that I use a lot in these streams because it's my opinion. I guess it's unfortunately one of the few sources we have about the um, about the Witch King and the Nazgul as a general. And as, of course, they are very special cases. They are kind of very interesting um, entities in the world. That fascinate a lot of people, so I always have to come back to this um, um, to this particular quote. But um, in the early writings, it, it comes down to a bit to interpretation, I would argue. But in theory, since the terminus of well, the term sorcerer or wizard exists exists in the world, even the word necromancer exists, and um, Saruman um, wanted to make people believe that 
it's maybe a Nazgul or maybe some other mortal. I I assume Mo most likely it's a Nazgul. I think he said um, in the text. However, um, it it was not like yeah, this must be an angelic being like us who can wield magic. So in my opinion, there is some plausibility in the idea that also mortals can learn to some degree what um, some might call magic. There's also the quote of Galadriel, um, who also says that you call this magic, though um, she would not do so. For her, it's not magic. And, and it, it depends on the perception. I try to also bring this point across in my video um, about magic, that if you have a certain knowledge, you can do things that seem like magic to others. And yeah, here in this uh, Silmarillion text about the Nazgul, um, we can read the, f or the origin of the Nazgul, we can read, men proved easier to ensnare. Those who used the nine rings became mighty in their day, kings, sorcerers, and warriors of old. So here we already have this particular um, part of it. They obtained glory and great wealth, yet it turned to their undoing. They had, as it seems, unending life, yet life became unendurable to them. They could walk, if they would, unseen by all eyes in this world beneath the sun. And they would see things in worlds invisible to mortal men, but too often they beheld only the phantoms and illusions of Sauron. And then they slowly became the nine Nazgul um, over time, that's the rest of the text describes. What is interesting is the first line that always keeps me thinking, and I, never, I, I don't have a good answer to this. Those who used the Nine Rings became mighty in their days, kings, sorcerers, and warriors of old. So the question is, those who used the Nine Rings became mighty in their days, and then they became kings, sorcerers, and warriors of old. Or was it those who used the Nine Rings, kings, sorcerers, and warriors of old became mighty in their day? I can't tell you what exactly this sentence want to express. I feel it's a bit um, a double-edged sort um, in this regard. However, if those who used um, the uh, nine rings and became mighty in their day were once kings, sorcerers, and warriors of old, uh, kings, sorcerers, and warriors of old, then this would imply that they were sorcerers before they had the nine rings. It could also be that the power they had is like as for example sorcerers like the witch king is kind of a sorcerer um, is based on these nine rings so that could be in this particular text mean that it is the source of power for them then there is another interesting text um, in the in the book um, Morgoth's ring I also quote in almost every stream because it's a very important source in my opinion that Tolkien writes um, in one of his texts, um, it was this Morgos element in matter, indeed, which was a prerequisite for such magic and other evils as Sauron practiced with it and upon it. I could maybe read this a bit differently and say, which was a prerequisite for such mad magic and other evils as, for example, Sauron practice. So this c you could kind of read into this that other others potentially who used such magic, and magic is here in the an Anführungszeichen, whatever that is in English, in quotes, I think you say, right? In quotes, magic. Um, that others could also use this Morgos element in matter to do, for example, some evil dark magic stuff with it. From this perspective, I would um, also argue that it might be possible for others to use this to do something. I would, though, always say, even I think, but what what is the similarity in both texts that we just read um, is that there's you can interpret it in a way also that. Here in the other text, the Nine Rings, in the other text, the Morgos element is a prerequisite for something like that. So to, to get the power, to get the skill, to get the magic, basically, you need something to use to get it, like one of the rings, or to kind of um, extract or utilize this Morgos 
element in matter. And that is, in my opinion, a um, potential secret to um, or potential way to answer um, your particular um, question here. And I think when he had then the nine ring, here we can go to letter 133, uh, 31, I think it is. Yeah, it's, to, it's a letter to Milton uh, Waldman. And in this letter, it's like, a, I think it published in the United States. And Tolkien gave him kind of a summary of the text. And now I have to find the thing. It's a very long letter. So it takes a moment for me to find the description. There's a description of the power of the rings. <laughs> of course, now I talk. I try to, to, to bridge um, my searching. And I simply failed miserably. <laughs> As, like I said, it's a really long letter. Maybe it's also a wrong letter. That would be unfortunate. Yeah, here we have it. The chief power of all the rings alike was the prevention or slowing of decay. For example, change viewed as a regrettable thing. The preservation of what is desired or loved or its semblance. This is more or less an elvish motif. But also they enhanced, and this is the important part, the natural power of a possessor, thus approaching magic, a motif easily corrupted into evil, a lust for domination. So here Tolkien clearly describes that these rings not only had this preservation thing or this anti-decay thing going on, but also enhanced the natural powers of the possessor, basically giving them something that you could call magic. Tolkien kind of, I feel like in at least the published writings of Tolkien, that he often tries to like avoid using the term magic in his, in his world. And even like if it's used, it's usually used by those who don't know. But those who know never use the word magic in a way or always think, yeah, it's magic. You know what I mean? It's um, something like this. It's a very interesting topic. Yeah, there is um, more to it, but you, you messaged me um, a few times. I need to check what you just wrote. Yeah, exactly. Indeed, Galadriel says uh, you call both my arts and the treachery of the enemy magic. Exactly, that's um, what I was referencing. But uh, we know, for example, that the Witch King had a part in breaking the gate of Minas Tirith, um, which seems to be magic. Yeah, for sure, there is, of course, some, some abilities that he has. Let me, maybe we have to look in, the, in exactly in what he does to break the gate, though. Let me just see. Where do we find this? Usually, I guess, looking to the text further sometimes really helps. Mastering for Rohan. How the feeling? Pie of Denisor battle. Should be in the battle, right? First, we search for Grond. The black captain rose, uh, rose in his stirrups and cried aloud in a dreadful voice, speaking in some forgotten tongue, words of power and terror, to rend both heart and stone. Thrice he cried, thrice the great ram boomed, and suddenly upon the last stroke the gate of Gondor broke. As if stricken by some blasting spell, it burst asunder. There was a flash of searing lightning, and the doors trembled in uh, in riven fragments to the ground. So that is um, what you have here. We have interestingly we we discussed this earlier in stream the thrice like uh, Maiglin hit the rock thrice, and I said like in I think in, in the Bible also three is like a number when you repeat something three times it becomes very important or powerful or amplified. And Tolkien kind of seems um, to use it here as well. But it's not necessarily like a holy number, kind of can be, but sometimes also like a number of power, if that makes sense. And um, yeah, it's kind of interesting that we also have thrice. Also, um, Maiglin smote 
to the to the rocks also thrice while falling down into the into the abyss into the flames so that is um also a um, very interesting here we have an interesting um fraction of interesting wording by tolkien though let me see forgotten tongue words of power that is a very fa because words in tolkien's world like if you have the authority your words can become powerful that is that's a very interesting contrast to this um I'm not sure if I find this fast, but it's a very interesting topic. I should make a video at some point that maybe tries to express this in a little bit more sophisticated way, because it's such a cool topic, I think. Uh, that was a mistake by my side, by my searching book to many meetings. I'm not sure if I find it. This will take a moment. <laughs> Maybe said <laughs> a bit harder, dudes in black. That is also a possibility. But he has. I mean, that is a very good point that you make. Potentially, even though I mean it for, um, to make um, a bit of um, on, on a more hum humorous note um that is an interesting point if you say yeah hit the door a bit harder and the people hit that start hitting the door a bit harder you had the authority in a strange way to make them hit the door harder if that makes sense maybe without him saying that the orcs would have just continued and nothing would have happened but now they put in a little bit more effort and then could get the result that is kind of i think the core what talking potentially not not necessarily the core but what Tolkien means with words having power. Let me see if I find the, 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 the passage. Like, it's an interesting contrast. Ah, I found it. Uh, here it is. Um, go back, he cried. Go back to the land of Mordor and follow me no more. His voice sounded thin and shrill in his own ears. The riders halted, but Frodo had <laughs> not the power of Bombadil. His enemies laughed at him with a harsh and chilling laughter. Come back, come back, they called. To Mordor we will take you. Go back, he whispered. And, like, this is the, the contrast. Like, Frodo said, go back. And they basically laughed at him. Because, as, he descri as Tolkien describes, his, vo his voice sounded thin and shrill in his own ears. And that is kind of different to when Gandalf would have said this or somebody other because he has authority or the Witch King says something. He has authority. Sauron says something. He has authority. Fingol, uh, Finrod says something. He has authority. Luthien and so on and so forth. Like there's definitely a difference between when Frodo says it early on. I feel like Frodo later also becomes more powerful and as Galadriel also describes his eyes more keen. But it's it's a process of growing into this and then suddenly you can make kind of magic happen if that makes sense but um you see the the difference um here in in this approach to um the other section where um yeah um the black captain rose up in his steps and cried aloud in a dreadful voice speaking in some forgotten tongue words of power and terror to rend both heart and stone thrice he cried thrice the great ram boomed and suddenly upon the last stroke the gate of gondor broke so it's, you see the difference in, in this. It was not like, yes, rice, he cried, and then, um, um, <laughs> uh, where was it? His voice sounded thin and shrill in his own ears, and the Gondorians laughed at him. That was not what's happening. Like, um, that's kind of the difference, I think. 
Words of power are magic. In a way, yeah. Like like Aladriel said, for, for some it's maybe magic, it's his treachery, but there's for sure some spells and stuff um, going on. I mean, even on a more supernatural um, um, a note, for example, we can write when uh, Mary um, um, basically rams his um, barrow blade into the um, heel of the of the um, of of the witch king. Uh, so so past the sword. Let me just see if I find it here. Oh, I just have the order in my head wrong. Okay. Found the passage I wanted to read. Uh, but uh, glad would he have been to know its fate who wrought it slowly long ago in the Norse kingdom when the Dunedain were young and chief among their foes was the dread realm of Angmar and its sorcerer king. No other blade, not though mightier hands had wielded it, would have dealt that foe a wound so bitter, cleaving, and now comes the important part, um, the undead flesh breaking the spell that knit his unseen sinews to his will. So there was like also some spell um, on him. It's spell also um, it is if if it's all like in like talking is of course as a language man, um, a language man, <laughs> but um, a, a spell is like also um, means something like. A story or like a speech, something like this. Words basically um, broken news. For example, um, uh, I think um, I'm not sure if it's it should be related to this word as well. Um, one of Gandalf's names is um, Last Spell, I think. I would assume it is uh, related to uh, to this, right? Let me just see. Do we find it? There it is. Origin, history of the word. Etymol last spell translates to ill news in Old English um, from, uh, from uh, lav, meaning causing hate, evil, injury, and spell, meaning story, message. So th this word is also kind of related. <laughs> it's interestingly, Tolkien uses the Old English word uh, last spell. Oh, it's really hard to tell, say for me. Um, last spell. And um, yeah, earlier in the book, and here we have the word spell. So there is like some some magic spell, like some words again, that were used to kind of knit his unseen sinews to his will. So that is always um, very interesting. Like the word in Tolkien's world is very powerful. That's basically what I... Um, wanted to to get at. Exactly, um, Sauron and Finrod exchanged songs of power. Songs are also like it's of course also a music component, but it also have like a song particular has also usually text in it, like some something that is said words. Like the um the the uh like the, the mentioned here in the text um long ago um in the Norse kingdom of the Dunedain were young and their foes uh, was the dread realm of Angmar and its sorcerer king. At least in this particular description, it says that it is, and the past uh, the the part uh, the past. So past the sword of the Barrow Downs, work of Westerness, how it's pronounced, <laughs> and <laughs> always have the same question every stream. How is this pronounced? But um, yeah, the, the the point is basically they the the Dunedain in this northern kingdom were from the Barrow Downs, that was part of Cardolan, and they fought against the Witch King in the past. So you could make it, it makes an argument, they made these blades to fight the Witch King and basically hunt him. So they were potentially designed to be good against the Nazgul and their um, enemies. And when he got hit by it, and 
I guess from this text, at least um, Frodo, I would argue, or the hobbits are the source for it. Um, no other blade, not though mighty hands had wielded it, would have dealt that foe a wound so bitter. So this kind of was breaking the spell in a way. It countered his authority and his... It, I, I like how he, Tolkien also mentions this, that... That, um, yeah. But glad would he have been to know its fate, who wrought it slowly long ago in the North Kingdom, when the Dunedain were young. So, like, his his mistake basically started to mess around with the North Kingdom so much, and he create there was something created that would later, pun not intended, sting him in the heel. I'm not sure if that's even a, a thing, but yeah. Yeah, Danhel made a lucky choice to bring Mary along with that for sure. Very interesting. Yeah, that was at least magic or uh, music was one way to express it, like because it also concluded world uh, words and we also have the music of the Ainur, which is the foundation of the creation of the of of the world itself. So, um that that is of course kind of important. So I think yeah, the sword definitely here in this case made um, the difference to counter that. That's a lot of fate in it um, um, intertwined with it, um, or added to to all this um, to all the stuff. Like we have the prophecy of um, of uh, Glorfindel and so on. Oh, excuse me. So, need to drink my tea here. <laughs> I would like to have uh, the Philosopher's Games in my um, Ask Magica campaign. <laughs> yeah, Grima names Gandalf um, Lost Spell. It's kind of interesting that the word spell is like a very, like an old English word for, for news or something like that, or message, story, something like that. Uh, it's funny because when you hear your voice through your own ear, it is deeper because of the... Uh, Re reverberations through your skull. So if it sounds shrill uh, to you, it would sound even shriller to others. That's that's a good, very good point, Mr. Man. I agree. What does uh, loss add to los Lorien? Let me just think. Like, it, it means, Los Lorien means, if I remember correctly, or is it just Lorien? It means dream flower or something, right? And just, uh, at the moment, Los Lorien means Lorien of the Blossom. Los is like the, uh, the Sindarin word, Lorien is dreamland. And Los would then mean flower, right? Yeah. Loss means flower. Flower blossom, yeah. Valorian is a place in um, in Amman where Irmo, also called Lorien. Interestingly, Irmo is a brother of Mandos, if I remember correctly. Mandos is also actually called, his actual name is Namo, but he's called Mandos, the place where he lives. Same with Irmo, whose actual name is Irmo, but he's um, called, um, uh, he is called, uh, what did I just say? Uh, Lorien, the place where he lives. I think the only the sister Nienna has I think for, for her nothing exists. There's also an artwork of Irmo, which I rarely show. Also by Kimberly 80, of course. Okay. 
Kind of like it. Could argue it's a bit special. Irmo, for people wondering, he is the Vala of dreams and illusions. So I kind of like the style um, <laughs> Kimberly AT uh, went here. But yeah, in Old English, loss means ill also, but in Sindarin, it means flower blossom. In his letter to Frodo, Gandalf says a uh, Baliman has a mind like a, a lumber room. <laughs> in England, a lumber room is a room used for storing old furniture. Interesting term. Okay, that's interesting. That's called a lumber room. Okay, I didn't know that. Thank you for um, this little information. I always have my in-ears in my ears, even though I don't hear any sound. It's kind of strange. Of course. Okay, uh, weren't there, aren't there any more questions in chat? But yeah, th these might be interesting ideas for, for future videos, I think. You know, somebody mentioned um, topics for future videos. Is this all gonna be on the exam? <laughs> I hope not. Hey everyone, happy to say that I have just started reading the Silmarillion for the first time. So my first question tonight is, where was Legolas during Morgoth's reign? So, uh, awesome. Uh, first of all, welcome, Tala. Nice to see you here. And I'm glad you started reading the Silmarillion. It can be, for in the first time, a very tough read, especially the beginning. I hope you make it through it and get to the more interesting stuff um, then after you have like the um, tons of name stuff behind you but it, it's all interesting the problem is sometimes you like for me I always, when I re read it first it need a bit of time to learn really appreciate um, some parts of it and um, then um, it became better and better and mind-blowing actually but uh, yeah, so Legolas is another interesting special case in this context. You won't find him in the Silmarillion mentioned at all because um, he was not born actually at this time. The reason for, like, we don't know when Legolas was born. I mean, in theory, it is possible that he was born already. But, um, well, I might have... It's actually not 100% true that you won't find... A, Legolas in the Silmarillion uh, because in Gondolin there is, an, is a Legolas like um, there is a name I'm not sure if Legolas appears in the Silmarillion though does somebody know? it might only appear in for example the Fall of Gondolin book no he's not in the Silmarillion but in a very old version of the Fall of Gondolin story, there is a Legolas mentioned in it. Let's put it that way. Can't... I probably would too take too long to look up how, how he is. Thanks for the answers. I was cooking on the side, so I uh, couldn't type. No problem. I wish you also um, uh, yeah, have a nice meal or so. Have a good one <laughs> uh, while eating. But yeah, no, no problem. I hope I could um, at least distantly answer your question because that's a very tough question to answer as well but back to um, Legolas so there is a Legolas in some versions that are not in the Silmarillion in versions of the fall of Gondolin just for completeness sake and uh, yeah so Legolas is most likely born later the, the reason for this like why was that? The The reason is a bit difficult to explain because we have the elven king, Thranduil. And in one version he has a father, Orofer. So it would make sense that Thranduil is relatively young and considering the age of an, the age of an elf, you would argue that his 
the child of Thranduil would then born when he had a certain age, if that makes sense. Of course, you can, because we have a lot of time um, prior to the second age, like a lot of time, where elves could have been born and have children and so on, you could make an argument that Legolas might have born. I'm not sure if there is any... Um, if there's any mention in a way that kind of... Um, no, I think there's no mention of Legolas to, I know of right out of the, out of the head, top of my head um, that, that kind of limits when he could be born. However, I would make an argument that if he has a grandfather in the form of Orofer, who was also the king of this woodland realm in the second age, and then his he died at the end of the second age, and in the third age his father Thranduil became king, that it makes sense that Legolas is a younger elf and probably has age-wise, he's maybe similar to Arwen, somewhat around this. So at the beginning, maybe born at the beginning of this third age. However, not in all versions, Orofer exists. There's another version, or in The Lord of the Rings, it is implied that the elves that left kind of um, um, Thingol's realm, um, that also upon them was Thranduil. I'm not sure if that's explicitly worded like this in The um, Lord of the Rings. Let me just see if I find it's an appendix B what I'm uh, referring to. Just don't know how it's phrased exactly. Let me just see. Uh, there he is. So the text goes In the beginning of this age, many of the high elves still remained. Most of these dwelt in Lindon, west of Ered Luin. But before the building of the Barad Dur, many of the Sindar passed eastward. So after the War of Ras, they passed eastward, and some established realms in the forests far away, where their, uh, where their people were mostly Sylvan elves. Thranduil, king of the north of Greenwood the Great, was one of these. Urufer is not mentioned here. As said, it's only in the version published in Unfinished Tales. He had a father, like there's a step in between. In Lindon, north of the uh, of the of the Loon, uh, dwelt Gilgalad, last of the kings of the Noldor in exile. He was acknowledged as High King of the Elves of the West. In Lindon, south of the Loon, for a time, Kili, uh, Kiliborn, kinsman of Thingol and his wife, was Galadriel, greatest of elven women. She uh, she was sister of Finrod, Felagund. Interestingly, in earlier versions, in other like here, we find the name. Um, we find a, a different name here. A friend of men, once king of Nargothrond, who gave his life to save Beren, son of Barahir. Interestingly, it might be even shorter in the original um, text. However, this kind of implies that at the beginning of the Second Age, Thranduil was already king in the north, even before. Like we have the mention before. Uh, let me just see. Uh, but before the building of the Baradur, so before uh, the, the Dark Tower was built of Sauron, um, he was potentially already king in, in the north. This contradicts the other version where he had the father who is king at this time, interestingly. but And this is, in my opinion, the most canon version. However, in this version, it is possible that if he has king in this time, that um, Legolas was also born in this time in the Second Age. However, it is also possible that he's born in the First Age already. That is not 100% clear. I'm not sure if there's any reference in Lord of the Rings, particularly, or in the Silmarillion, that kind of limits um, the birth date of this. Maybe-ish. Then we have to go to The Hobbit, which is another special case in a weird way but is also an interesting source in this contract, I have to say. Legolas is not mentioned in The Hobbit directly, but there is... Uh, with that he put on Bilbo a small coat of mail wrought for some young elf prince long ago. This is like um, an interesting little note here. What could this young elf prince be? Like, it seems the context of this mail is that this 
small coat of mail was once wrought for a young elf prince. So there was a time when Thorin and Erebor had a good relationship to the... Um, oh, Refractive Rambling is here. Welcome. Nice to see you. Where the um, Erebor and the Thorin, or his father Thror and so on, had a good relationship with... or semi-good relationship with the elves from... Um, uh, from, from Greenwood the Great, from with Thranduil and his elves. And for him, he might have wrought for long, long ago a coat of mail for a young elf prince. So this might be a reference to Legolas in The Hobbit, who can interpret it as such. It could also be another elf prince, I don't know, but there shouldn't be that many elf princes around in this particular time. This, if we think of Thror, we are late Third Age. If we would interpret it this way, this would mean that Legolas might be born late in the Third Age. Because there he was still young and needed a small coat of mail, probably for a child, because it should fit Bilbo. And this is the explanation why there is even a small coat of, uh, coat of mail that can fit a hobbit. And not a sturdy dwarf. Um, and so on. So there is definitely... Uh, this particular connection. I'm not sure if there's another connection for Legolas. But yeah, Legolas himself is of course not mentioned in The Hobbit. There's only this reference. And you have to keep in mind this text was most likely written before. Um, was written before um, The Lord of the Rings existed. And the character of Legolas is also a very late invention of Tolkien. Originally, for the Lord of the Rings, Tolkien planned that Glorfindel would be take would basically become the elf of the Fellowship, and um, then later he um, said, "No, I don't want to do this," and he invented Legolas as a character, and he became the son of Thranduil. He's a very young character um, that Tolkien um, wrote in the writing process, and um, as such, he is not mentioned in the um, old stories. That is also a further argument that it's more likely that Tolkien said, okay, he's a young, el like a young elf prince, if you want to call him like that, and um, I don't want to retrospectively write him into all my Silmarillion um, stories that he's maybe potentially mentioned there, because um, as said, also Thranduil is a newer character. That's also the reason why he's not really appearing in the Silmarillion and so on. So, um, yeah, it's it's always very, very complicated with this. Like, I think Thranduil appears um, in the Silmarillion a few times, most likely in the um, text uh, called um, Of the Rings of Power and the Third Age. I'm not sure if he appears before that. I don't think so, no. But Tolkien wrote him at least in it, and the text um, of the Rings of Power and the Third Age is also, I assume, related to the um, appendixes texts. So short, long, long answer short, um, Legolas was, n you will, won't, unfortunately we we'll, won't find um, Legolas in the Silmarillion because the character didn't exist as a character when Tolkien wrote most of these texts, point one. Second, um, even if we consider the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings and so on, for me it seems more plausible that he was also born maybe in the Second Age, most likely in the Third Age, and maybe he is the same age as Arwen, or she was born like 100 something or 200, no, 200 something in the um, third age, or even later, like, let's say, I don't know, um, the, the Erebor face is relatively long um, of the dwarves, and it was abandoned one time in between for the Grey Mountains and so on and so forth. But um, the end says, like, it's complicated because there's another Thorin. He, le he le um, Thorin the first. The Thorin from The Hobbit is Thorin the second. And um, Thorin the first abandoned 2210. Maybe it was in, at this time that this mithril thing was um, made for the prince. Or it was even later than we are in the realm of, um, of uh, Thror who re-established um, the kingdom there, that was 2590. So in theory, 
it could be this time. However, if that is the case, it's kind of strange and Legolas would be too young again because then Legolas would be at the time of Lord of the Rings only um, less than 500 years old and usually they beca elves become adult at the year of 1000. So I would argue um, the other date would fit a bit better. Then Legolas would be a very young elf though still. So I hope um, this uh, kind of... Uh, Awesome. Also, thank you for, for uh, nice to see you, Reflective Rambling. I hope you had a good time. Now I can look at chat again because I, I hope this kind of answers your uh, question. But yeah, I hope I wish you a lot of fun with the Silmarillion. Also, Fifi Trixiebel wrote um, in the context: Is there anybody here who reads the Silmarillion? I had no troubles with it. For me, it was very easy, and I, I devoured it in my, uh, uh, in a very short time. That it's very interesting because I I remember also struggling um, when I started reading um, the Silmarillion. But um, I can definitely see that some people um, might devour it just in a very short time like you. But I could imagine it's um, more rare. I'm uh, not sure. Also, Mr. Man, just um, appreciate. Um, just read the Aino Lindale, uh, Lindale um, recently. No, that's a very good point. I think it's just um, so cool seeing the actual universe. We have um, a familiar scientific, a vigorous understanding of being described through the frame of reference of the legendarium. Yeah, I agree with this. <laughs> Reflective Rem just shouts out here, the, the, the in, invokes people or in... Um, tries to convince people to press a like button, which I um, fully agree. Also subscribe and stuff. Everything is much appreciated. And if you see this as a VOD or so, maybe write something nice in the comments would also be much appreciated. Or check some of the other video stuff just to make a little bit of um, advertisement here for my channel. So yeah, much appreciated. Do you think... Um, Yores is the funniest character in all the rings, or maybe Gaffer. I think Gaffer is also kind of a funny character. It's not that funny, I guess, in the books. So the films you only see him. I really like the scene. Maybe I have a screenshot of that. And what I can show. Let me just see if I find it. It is from the first Hobbit film, so I can already put in the credits here. Screenshot. Let me just. I think I saved it as Gaffer Gumchi. Yeah. But yeah, there is a scene where these uh, old lads, are, old Hobbit lads, sitting there in the in the Green Dragon, and um, talking about the recent events in the Hobbit. I really love this scene. Like, <laughs> it's uh, I don't know. They really nailed kind of the character of this particular situation uh, in the films, I feel very funny. Did Elrond and Círdan carry the Rings of Power while fighting during the War of the Last Alliance? We know the rings were hidden and their location only known to the White. That's a difficult um, question um, to answer because we have, if I remember correctly, two versions. I don't think, like, um, I, 
usually when Sauron has a one ring, the elves did not wear the rings anyway. So they potentially did not have them with them and kept them at home where they are safe. That would be my assumption. Because when there are multiple references that hint at that this was the case, like when Sauron did not, when Sauron had the one ring at this time, they would hide the ring, not put it on their finger. The question though is, when did Elrond and Círdan get those rings? There's one version that after, if I should it be after? No. There's one version where I think... There's one version where after the um, War of Elves and Sauron, so thousands, two thousand, no, let's say 1,800 years earlier or something like that, um, there was like a count, like the, the, let's call it a kind of a white council, I think in Rivendell. And um, though it's not 100% sure where it was, if I'm not mistaken, though it might be. I, th I think it was in Rivendell. And in this, uh, Gil-galad basically made Elrond his vice regent in this version. I think he also already gets the ring, um, the ring maybe there or around that time. So much earlier to the last line. So in theory, Elrond already had his ring in this version. I think same as Círdan. Later, though, it's not 100% clear, though, when um, Elrond gets the ring. Like, there's a different version. I forgot what how, how, how it was there. Maybe we can find something here. Ilya. Must be an article. Okay. This text here goes with a version where this white council happens from the unfinished tales. I think there's like another wording somewhere where this is phrased differently. But I, I unfortunately I can't uh, fully remember how it was phrased. No, I can't fully remember it. Maybe somebody in chat knows. It mixes oddly with a voice. Okay. You mean this main picture here? Which one is Gaffer? That's a really good question. Um, does somebody know in chat? I would assume the right one is Gaffer. He sits also on the other, uh, like on the other side of Sam and Gaffer, Sam's father. Um, and the other is like uh, the Miller man. Like there are two Millers, right? I'm not sure anymore. Maybe somebody in chat knows. Yeah, then a voice of Geekdom also has a Silmarillion um, series where he goes uh, through it with also a lot of uh, detail. So I can recommend this as well. He's currently quite busy, so he potentially hasn't pumped out a lot of content recently, unfortunately. But yeah, voice of Geekdom link. Shoutouts to Den. Hope you're doing well. Maybe I should have to write him a message or so. <laughs> I bet Kirdan hit his ring in the newest ship he had uh, in Wharf. <laughs> Interesting idea. Yeah, exactly. Gandalf used um, uh, the ring um, to, to encourage others uh, to fight, for example. 
But at this time when Gandalf had the ring, um, Sauron had not the one ring, so he could of course openly carry it, and he got it from Círdan. Uh, Círdan's ring maybe maintained um, Lindon, because Gil-galad was not there anymore. He died at the end of the Second Age, at least later on. And he was always in Mithelond, with, uh, even when Gil-galad was alive. At least you missed the rings of power talk. Okay, well, for some of that people, that's definitely better. <laughs> I devoured the Silmarillion. It was more Tolkien, and I needed more Tolkien. It's good to hear. I found it rather easy too. So it's, it's about the question how um, difficult was the Silmarillion reading on your first time. I also like kind of struggled a bit with it. I just hoped somebody um, would have an answer to the question, what happened in the other version to the rings? The problem is I would have to do some research on it. I simply can't remember even um, that is Elrond wore Mantle of Grace, uh, Blue Storm, the Mightiest of the Three. No, that's not it. Ring of Air. Mm, maybe it's uh, like my my memory leads me to Appendix A. Then it's Silmarillion in the Silmarillion. I should maybe speak in complete sentences. <laughs> then it's in the Silmarillion. And water and air set by ruby, adamant and sapphire and all of the elements are most desire to possess them. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Manwe had a, um, a scepter of sapphire. Interesting. But that's not what I'm looking for. Uh, 
Yet after the fall of Sauron, their power was ever at work, and where they abode, the mirth also dwelt, and all things were unstained by the griefs of time. Therefore, I forgot how it's pronounced again. As the second, uh, the third age was ended, the elves perceived that the ring of Sapphire was with Elrond. In the fair valley of Rivendell, upon those houses, stars of heaven most brightly shone, where the ring of adamant was in, Los, uh, in the land of Lorien, where dwelt the Lady Galadriel, a queen she was of the woodland elves, the wife of Celeborn of Dorias. Yet she herself was of the Noldor, and remembered the day before the days in Valinor, and she was the mightiest and fairest of all elves that remained in Middle-earth. But the red ring remained hidden until the end and none save Elrond and Galadriel and Círdan knew whom he had been uh, whom it had been committed hmm doesn't help us chat okay next source would be unfinished tales At that time, Gilad gave via the ruling to Elrond and appointed him as vice regent. I mentioned this version earlier. Okay, now I'm curious. Oh, that's interesting. In this version, there's also an interesting difference. Wielding the Elisa, all things grew fair about Galadriel until the coming of the shadow to the forest. But afterwards, when Nenya, chief of the three, was sent to her by Kilibrimbor, she needed as, as she thought no more, and she gave it to Kilibrian, her daughter. And so it came to Arwen in Aragorn, who was called Elisa. So, um, yeah, here's a note 22. In the Lord of the Rings, um, Vilja is called the chief or the, or the most powerful of the three. In this old text, we find in the history of Galadriel and Kiliborn, we notice that Nenya um, was, in this version, Nenya was the chief of the three. Very interesting detail, just never really noticed. Vice Regent Ah, okay, I found the second version. It's also in the history of Galadriel and Kiliborn. It's in Unfinished Tales. So there are two versions in, in the same book. Like both versions are published here. So it's about that. Um, it was at that time that she, Galadriel, received Nenya, the White Ring from Kilibrimbor, and by its power the realm of Lorinan, so Los Lorien, was strengthened and made beautiful. But its power upon her was great, also uh, was great also and unforeseen, for it increased her latent desire for the sea and for return into the west, so that her joy in Middle Earth was diminished. Kilibrimbor followed her counsel that the ring of air and the ring of fire should be sent out of Eregion, and he entrusted them to Gilgalad in Lindon. And now Tolkien has a note or in uh, adds to this what is like what do you say it in Klammern in in, in, in German? <laughs> in brackets, yeah, of course. <laughs> in brackets, it is said here that at this time Gilgalad gave Narya the Red Ring to Círdan, Lord of the Havens. But later in the narrative, there is a, a marginal note that he kept it himself until he set out for the War of the Last Alliance. So here in this version, it is basically a kind of mentioned that there was also the idea in Tolkien's head um, that he might have kept at least um, 
the red ring um, Naria for himself until um, he be, and shortly before he set out to the War of the Last Alliance. So, to answer your question, during the War of the Last Alliance, they already had the ring, but when exactly they had the ring is not clear. It seems it doesn't tell though if Elrond got his ring at this time too. That's a bit difficult. But these two versions kind of contradict each other a little bit. I think there's no mention about the blue ring though in this context, which uh, yeah makes matters of course always a bit complicated. Yeah, this, he also says they should have destroyed all the rings of power this time, but they failed to find the strength. Galadriel uh, counseled him that the three rings of the elf should be hidden, never used and dispersed, far from Eregion, where Sauron believed them to be. It was at that time, and so on and so forth. This is very, it's a very interesting um, text, in my opinion, and recommend reading it in the Unfinished Tales, in the um, chapter... History of Galadriel and Kiliborn. Concerning Galadriel and Kiliborn, it's um yeah pretty mighty text here in the the book. <laughs> the moment when someone as learned as Chris has never really noticed. Yeah. Well, let's phrase like I read this chapter in the past, but I simply forgot forgot about it. Like there's so many details in this book that um, it's so easy to forget. Like this is like a half sentence in a, I don't know, um, four hundred page long book. So, <laughs> and there are multiple of those. I mean, it's not clear, like, I, in my opinion, it would be, like, it would be, st the problem with the War of the Last Alliance is that it plays in Mordor, and in my opinion, if they lose this war, it would not be smart to have the rings in Mordor, <laughs> you know what I mean? So, I can't imagine they took them, took the rings with them to the War of the Last Alliance. I mean, it is possible, but I... It's, ne it's not mentioned where the rings are during the last, of, of the last alliance. But I personally would have thought that they left them behind. Because we go to Mordor, we fight Sauron, and if we lose or whatever, he doesn't get all the rings for free. Okay, in this version, Vilya's always given to him in this way. It's interesting. Uh, what? I hope this kind of answers your question. But as I said, it's, it's um, a very difficult... Uh, no, it's not a difficult topic. The problem is simply... I don't remember, like there's somewhere a mention of the other ring as well and it contradicts what we read here. I only remember, I have somehow memorized this in my head, but I can't fully reconstruct um, all the, the information here.
Uh, what would the world have looked like, in your opinion, if the Valar hadn't uh, have an enemy like Melkor? Would have been boring and perfect. Potentially, it would have been boring and perfect. Yes. And I think the elves, um, like Morgoth, my opinion, always had like um, a role to play in ensnaring elves and men. So yeah, maybe it would have been boring and perfect. They couldn't use the rings while Sauron has his, so there's no reason to bring them to Mordor. Exactly, we couldn't use them anyway. Why would um, he care about obtaining the other rings though? Um, the other rings were also powerful. Like, you... Like for example, the dwarves, he later gifts them... I mean, it's a stupid example because originally all the rings of power are elvish rings, except for the one ring of course, but... Um, they all are elvish rings. And later, when he gifted them, like, he could do stuff with it. He could gift them to humans, to dwarves. It didn't work for the dwarves, so he was very angry at that. I can tell you that. But um, in theory, the dwarves could have used the rings without much effect, even when Sauron had the one ring, which is kind of fascinating, fascinating detail with the, with, with the ring, I find. So um, that kind of, kind of worked out for the for the dwarves. They were basically immune to his power though the rings of like the, the seven rings of power still had like a negative effect on the on the dwarves like it, it brought kind of evil over them as well and made them a bit more greedy which resulted in them digging too deep i guess but at least the uh, dwarves in uh, moria but oh, excuse me and um yeah so there there's that Still, um, yeah, having so many powerful items in the hand of your enemies is never like a good feeling. Like you could have them and do something useful with it. So that is why he wanted to have the rings back. And though the three elven rings were the most powerful of the uh, rings of power, the other were also very powerful rings with kind of a very similar purpose, just with few um, differences here and there. For example, the three rings would not render the wearer invisible, while the um, other 16 rings would do that, plus a one ring, I guess. But yes, he thought, I want them, my plan didn't work. And um, we can also read that um, he always thought that men would be easier to ensnare, but he wanted the elves because the elves would make more powerful servants. And he was kind of greedy himself. That's an interesting question, Pumpkin Rick. I don't worry about um, your questions. It's um, very confusing, in my opinion. A lot of misconceptions and I weird, I not weird, but because it is so complicated and the there's like no text. Okay, the rings of power. Now I explain you all of the rings of power stuff in one text. You have to kind of puzzle the information together from like five different sources. That makes it, of course, a bit convoluted. And also the films portray some ideas that um, might confuse a lot of people. And right now you have, I think, in a lot of people's minds, like a mixture of all kinds of ideas about these rings. And um, even I struggle at times to piece them together correctly, especially if some versions are contradicting each other. But um, that's uh, another topic. So... There is a mention in Lord of the Rings. Let me just see if I can find a multiple. Seven and the nine. Of course, I had a typo. Um, you have perceived my thought more clearly than many um, that are accounted wise. You saw the eye of him that holds the seven and the nine. And did you not see and recognize the ring upon my finger? Did you see my ring? She asked, turning again to Sam. No, lady answered. Uh, to tell you the truth, I wondered what you were talking about. I saw a star through your finger, but it would pardon my speaking uh, out. I think my master was right. I wish you would take his ring and so on and so forth.
Yet even so, as ring bearer and as one that has borne it on a finger and seen which is hidden, your sight, uh, your sight is grown keener. You have perceived my thought more clearly than many that I counted wise. You saw the eye of him that holds a seven and the nine. Did you see and recognize um, the ring upon my finger? Did you see my ring? She asked, and then turning to Sam. So Sam couldn't see the ring. Um, uh, Ninja on, on Galadriel's finger. Frodo could see it. And for, they, they talk a little bit about the power of the One Ring and so on and so forth. And um, in, in this context, I actually forgot what um, the original question was. You asked... Um, now, in this in this particular line, though, we can also notice that they could see and perceive Sauron, and he holds the seven and the nine. Technically, he only holds four of the uh, three of the of the seven and the nine. But it seems that Sauron collected the rings of power for himself at the time when he had not the One Ring anymore in the Third Age. So at the time of the Lord of the Rings, and he was wearing four of the seven rings and the nine here. Tolkien shortcutted the phrasing by the seven and the nine. Um, four of the of these um, seven rings were consumed by dragons or by fire or whatever, and so are destroyed. So there are only three of the seven rings left. Still, they are now the seven, even though they are only three, if that makes sense. And of course, the nine of the Nazgul. So we also learn that the Nazgul don't need the rings of power to be the Nazgul. They are still the Nazgul without the rings, and Sauron have those rings, I assume, to increase his own power. I think there was another. So, yeah, here in the, I think it's in the Council of Elrond? No, it's in the Shadow of the Past, right? Yeah, the Shadow of the Past. Gandalf also comments on this. Let me see if I find the place again. <laughs> ah, there it is. Uh, so it is now. The nine he has gathered for himself, the seven also, or else they are destroyed. There are three, uh, the three are hidden still, but that no longer troubles him. He only needs the one, for he made that ring himself, and it is his, and he let a great part of his own former power pass into it, so that he could rule the others. So here... Gandalf also, like we have Galadriel who confirms this, that Sauron has the seven and the nine, and Gandalf also says it, he has seven and the nine, or else are destroyed. So, the three remaining three. And he gathered them to himself, so to benefit him in some way. So I assume he only takes the um, seven and the nine to help. Maybe that's another statement in the Silmarillion. Seven hearts is the seven rings. Luminor, seven stones. It's wrong. Yeah, no, seven. The one and the seven and the nine are destroyed. The three have passed away. That it ended. For he rules the nine, and of the seven he has recovered three. We must strike. Also says oh, another confirmation of it. I, unfortunately, not sure if there's like another more explicit. Um, mention of that somewhere. If somebody knows in chat, feel free to post the quote so people know what I'm talking about. But yeah, uh, but no man gave the nine for men proved. Um, Mm 
Nine, I destroyed one, seven, uh, no, but that should be um, kind of it. So, yeah, he I assume wears those rings to become him more powerful, as we have read in letter 131. Um, the chief power of all the rings was the preservation, slowing of the decay, and so on and so forth. But also they enhance the natural powers of a possessor, thus approaching magic, a motif easily corruptible into evil, a lust for domination. So we can assume he used this for to gain even more power himself. I have to go now. Great stream. Happy New Year, everybody. Until next time. Yeah, Mark, she said probably don't. You're probably gone already because I was too busy answering this question, which often takes quite a bit of time. But yeah, we're also happy to uh, wish you a good, a guten Rutsch ins neue Jahr, as we say in Germany. I think the three elven rings were made to conserve the world from what I found. Conserve, for example, the golden world. I think, yeah, that is definitely part of it, but technically that's part of the uh, intention of all the rings, like the preservation and slowing of the decay and the preservation of what is desired or lo loved. And um, the this aspect, though, was stronger, I guess, in the three rings. The um, elves of Eregon made three supremely beautiful and powerful rings almost solely of their own imagination and directed to the preservation of beauty. They did not confer invisibility, but secretly in the subterranean fire. Oh, that, that is not part of this anymore. But that is now how the one ring is um, bought. But yeah, all... Like I said in this um, in this brief, the chief power of all the rings alike, without, I guess, the exception is one ring, was the prevention or slowing of decay. For example, change viewed as a regrettable thing, the preservation of what is desired or loved, or its semblance. Um, this is more or less an elvish motif, but also the uh, they enhance the natural power of it uh, of a possessor, thus approaching magic, a motif easily corruptible into evil, a lust for domination. So they enhance the power, and this is basically the access for Sauron to corrupt them into evil because it generates a lust for domination. And finally, um, they had powers more directly derived from Sauron. Um, the necromancer, so he is called, as he casts a fleeing, a fleeting shadow and uh, presage on the pages in The Hobbit, such as uh, rendering invisible the material body and making things of the invisible world visible. This is very important in the context of the um, text with the um, delusions of Sauron. Um, they could walk if they would, unseen by all eyes in the world beneath the sun. And they could see things in worlds invisible to mortal men, but too often they beheld, uh, beheld only the phantoms and delusions of Sauron. So while seeing the invisible, they were more... Uh, it was easier for Sauron to just get get in contact with them, with his phantoms and delu delusions, to um, trick them and bring them under his control. And this effect, as we can read here... Um, was different for the three rings of power. They did not confer invisibility, as we can read in letter 131. I, ne I need to make a video. I really plan for quite a time um, to make a video about the misconceptions of the rings of power. I'll probably also call it like that. Maybe i make it in German or in English and German. I'm not sure yet.
Yeah, for sure. He could try to corrupt um, Elf or so with the other three when he had the one. Very interesting. Or made a great point that connects with um, that sword. Manwin and Yena and Melkor are a balance. Each help us appreciate the... Um, uh, yeah, appreciate the stuff of life. Okay, um, do not know what happened with the spaces uh, there, sorry, <laughs> no problem. So, that yes, without Melkor, three would be a diminished appreciation for beauty and light, and only shadow can make us aware. Yeah, I guess three is always like a very balanced number in a way. We have this motif also in the um, Rings of Power show, interestingly, which I kind of. I, I like the point that they make, try to make with with this particular little sentence they put in the show. That two would mean like um, conflict, but three has kind of um, a balance. Okay, welcome, Mary, to the club of the philosophers. Um, also, thank you for Reflective Rambling for gifting um, membership here. Much, much appreciated, Reflective Rambling. Thank you so much for your support. Also, lagging behind in messages, it seems... Another gift. What? Christmas is already over. Reflective rambling, like <laughs> a few days behind this. But thank you, much, much appreciated for the second one. What's going on? Here? Nowhere. Now we have um, Kirdan also as part of the uh, members here. So very cool. Much appreciated. You have to update the credit though. <laughs> okay, that is a good point. Uh, for whatever reason, glancing Gandalf's pose in the corner of my eye, I thought he was shredding on an electric guitar. Yeah, now I see it as well. <laughs> it can't be unseen anymore. At least when I look from the side. That's pretty cool. <laughs> Again, shoutouts to Kimberly80 who made um, this fantastic artwork. It's usually a bit bigger. I zoomed it in quite a bit. Yeah, definitely a possibility that it might have corrupt Thranduil as well and in some form difficult to say. Did ships transport elves via the straight road and then return for more passengers or did they uh, need new ships and crews for every trip? I have no idea. Like That's a very interesting question as well. What happens with the ships? Do they sail back? I don't know. In theory it is possible because the when the straight road wasn't a thing um, elves from Tol Eresia sailed between mid, uh, between um, Numinor and um, Tol Eresia. So maybe there was like a way that they could sail back, but I don't know. Like if they maybe didn't put foot on the land, they could sail back. Just put them in a little boat and yeah, you have now to um, take the oars and <laughs> make contact with the island over there. Something like that. I'm not sure. Or maybe they had to stay there as well. I have to admit, I can't fully... Um...
If Gandalf had a band, what would it be called? I don't know. I tried to come up with a very good name, but my English is not good enough for that. I, I need something like, I don't know, like Istari would mean those who know. <laughs> you could make, I don't know, those who rock or something out of it. But the word for rock would ideally rhyme with no. You know what I mean? <laughs> but I can't come up with a word that fits. The East study uh, arrived by ship after the world was made round. Is this the only... Um, yeah, I think this might be the only um, example where somebody came back from a straight road. The, another one would be um, Elfwine. That is the Anglo-Saxon lord that went over the straight road to Amman and recorded all the Elvish stuff there. But um, that he was uh, excluded from the Silmarillion, but originally he was part of it. So basically, of our time, it is, is the explanation how this story of the elves and so on got into our world and it was found by Tolkien. He also, I think, returned um, then to his world, basically, again. I need another tea here. Okay, Chad. We are, we are pr reaching the four hour mark, which is, and it's getting late here as well. I would slowly, very slowly wrap it up. So if you have more questions of interest, feel free to post them. Gandalf is more a band manager. Radagast would be the lead singer, etc. So it's the Hedgehogs, famous for their primal metal. <laughs> the Flying Fools. I like that. Is also a pretty good name. <laughs> Mithrandir and the Flying Fools, that's good. <laughs> Treading Tari. <laughs> Grey to white, yeah. Some good names here. East Daddy Rock Art. I wonder what happened to the Palantiri in the Fourth Age and beyond. It makes me smile imagining the elves Neresia peeking curiously through the stone to see um, the minion of men and, and their progress. It's an interesting uh, point. So, can't tell. Uh, I can't tell you what happens with the um, with this, with the Sauron Palantir. Maybe we haven't seen many maps today, so in a weird way we should look at map stuff. So, I don't know. Baradur is somewhere here, I think. That should be one of the Palantiri, I assume, because Sauron had one of them when it was destroyed. Maybe the Palantir was also destroyed considering um, that it was possible to... They got lost a few times. I would assume this one got lost as well. I would not be um, surprised by that. Then Minas Tiris had one. That must be still there. Isnyar had one that uh, must be still there. And here, in Emun, uh, Emun Bereit, um, we had the Tower Hills and the Elostirion Tower that also had one always. And then, of course, on the West Continent, Amman, 
on the island of Tol Eresia, there was the Master Stone, which was not part of the seven Palantiri of Middle Earth, of course, but there was another one. So in theory, yeah, they should be still there and they're not tied or bound to the rings of power. So in theory, they should also still work and um, function. <laughs> Map out Gandalf's first Turing gig. That's, that's, a, that's a good question, to be honest. I feel like... Like it's it's difficult to to tell how how popular the band would be. Like if the band just starts, maybe their first tour would be in in a smaller village. So I, I kind of like the idea he's playing in in the bar of um in the bar <laughs> in the pub. <laughs> it's not a pub in the prancing pony like in Brie or so. That would be maybe the start of the tour. And of course, um, he has at least some fans in in the Shire. So maybe he tours in Hobbiton. Uh, somewhere there. There are also several places where he could um, do them. Maybe um, Mikkel Delving and then Miss Lond or so to the elves and then later um, when the when the fame spreads over. He, I mean he has later also friends again in Edoras and then he can also go to Minas Tiris basically the, as, as the latest thing. Not sure what happened with Osgilias but Maybe that too when it's rebuilt or something. And then maybe make a coast tour down here in Pilargir and uh, <laughs> all the way to Ezelond or so. Something like that. <laughs> I don't know. But now we skip. Like I mean, the elves are gone. The trees probably don't like... Um, I don't know if trees like the music. Pangorn would be also an interesting place as a result. Also, we should not exclude Erebor, which is also active. And Erebor, I heard, also had some Gandalf fans. So maybe Erebor has to be um, uh, included as well. I don't know. I'm not sure. Something like that. That's also a very difficult to answer question, unfortunately. So what does the... Um, uh, what do you think makes the rivers, Enchanted River, um, the Wizzy Windle River, um, enchanted and magical? I mean, it's we had like a similar question to, um, the, um, to, to, the, to the Bjorning stuff. Let me just see. Who has... Do we have an do I have an artwork of Bjorn? I mean I have an, a screenshot of the Hobbit so oh, carefully here. Okay, Kimberly uh eighty made an interesting artwork of Bjorn. Um we talked about him why the animals are so intelligent and dexterous around him previously. My answer was somewhat um in the direction uh, on the meta level that the Hobbit is kind of a special case. Uh, in, in a way that it's more like a fairy tale story and I would imagine that um, this explanation you could also make count for for example the enchanted river I feel like where well, we have these magical rivers and places that have some strange effect as we slow fastly enter the um, or quickly enter the, um, the the realm of fairy tale stuff as a result I would try to find like um a similar um I would go with a similar answer of that I'm not sure if there's any origin story to the enchanted rivers Hmm. Its water was black and carried a curse that gave the rivers its name. So there was a curse on it. Who gave the curse on it? I don't know. I'm really curious what um, the curse, where the curse idea is coming from. Like I don't know the. I would have to reread the Orbit chapter. I haven't read it in too too long a time that I remember the exact wordings there.
Maybe somebody in chat knows, so feel free to post if we have some Hobbit expert. No. No idea, chat. Somebody has an idea in chat. Can't find a reference to a curse here. Enchanted, enchanted door. Think safe, of course, enchanted stream. Hmm. Ah, uh, here's this. Here's the thing. There is one stream there I know, black and strong, which crosses the path. Didn't we had established that maybe black or so could also mean it's deep or very dark? Of course, which um, uh, black and strong, which one? They that uh, that you should neither drink of or bathe in. For I have heard that it carries enchanted. Enchantment and a great drowsiness and forgetfulness. And in the dim shadows of that place, I don't think you will shoot anything wholesome or unwholesome without straying from the path that you must not do for any reason. It is all the advice I can give you. There's not mention of a direct of a curse or something like that, at least. There were streams and springs along the road, but your way through the Mirkwood is dark, dangerous, and difficult. He said, water is not easy to find there, nor food. The time is not yet come for nuts, though it may, it may be past and gone indeed uh, before you get to the other side. And nuts are about all that grows there, fit for food. In there the wild things are dark, queer, and savage. I will provide you with skins for carrying water, and I will give you some bows and arrows, but I doubt very much whether anything you find in market will be wholesome to eat or to drink. There's one stream then. I don't know. Uh, that's Mirkwood from The Hobbit. Yeah, the Mirkwood and the enchanted um, stream where the hobbits um, have to go through. Dark river, do not swim. Dark squirrel, do not eat. Etc. Yeah, <laughs> basically that. I mean, that is a good point. The Enchanted river, that's a good point, Joe. It could be maybe like Sauron affected the whole forest in a way. And um, as such, he might have kind of enchanted, cursed, or whatever this river to, I don't know, 
make it difficult. We also had to have the spiders of Shelob there. Maybe they kind of enchanted it less. I, I, I don't think so, though. I, I think maybe Sauron as, as evil mojo livering, uh, lingering in this place, as um, Joe says it, um, is maybe a good candidate for this. Maybe, it's also a theory, maybe the elves as some kind of protection mechanism from Sauron, like they enchanted the river and um, to protect themselves so nothing can cross that river that easily and they have more control over the region or so. Also a possibility. But I think it's not really um, clear who exactly enchanted the river. I like your um, thinking there. Yeah, it's kind of, like I said, um, it's a classical Hobbit thing where you have, um, like, it, it's a fairy tale in its core. Cups of Middle Earth uh, still waiting for that video. Yeah, that would be <laughs> that would be a cool video to be honest. I think In Deep Geek might be the better fit for it, as um, Reflective Rambling suggests, um, because he does um, his traveler guides. I could also imagine here Nerd of the Rings doing it, who also does like all travels of character X. But yeah, Trixie, I hope this kind of... An I, I mean, it's not a good answer, to be honest, but the, the best series I could come chat and, I, uh, and maybe I, to some part, could come up with. <laughs> I need this in my life now. What are we trying to find a spot for festival? Now we tried out what's going on with the dark rivers there. <laughs> okay, Fifi is um. Trixie Bell is um, happy with my answer. Good. But it was, a, it was an interesting question you asked, for sure. Perfect image 17. How about the Valar? Um, they're good. Yeah, I think they're um, doing kind of good. I don't know what exact content, um, uh, in which context you mean this, but I guess when Sauron is defeated and Morgoth is bent, they potentially have a far easier time not worrying about the evils of other Ainur and so on, so that's probably a good time for them after Lord of the Rings, I assume. And they have to wait like the end of the world, kind of, but that's probably not that good. But, I don't know, for, for a time there might be um, some peace. Chris, I've already sent him a message pleading for him to take it on or send it out to the greater fandom because we need this as a fandom, says uh, the only one here probably. So you mean um, um, you mean like real world pups or just pups in the, in the books as a video? I mean, there are not that many uh, pups in the, um, um, in the books, right? We have the Prancing Pony, we have a few in in the Shire. You could argue <laughs> Rivendell is one big pup, but... <laughs> that needs um, a bit of... Uh, it's a bit of exaggeration. Hi, is this a general ask questions? General ask questions um, in context of Tolkien, but in theory, um, yeah, you can just ask whatever question you want. But I won't stream that long anymore because I'm on it for four hours already. Uh, 
Uh, does the Lord tell us whether the stars would rise and set when the world was flat or was the earth unmoving relative to the stars? That's a really good question. I would imagine that the stars moved. Like, I can't imagine that that would not be the case. It would be a bit boring as well, like having the same star constellation all the time. But I'm not, I can't tell you if there's an, um, I mean, you could make some crazy theories um, based on this. So, they, like, Tolkien is a bit inconsistent with this whole, the world was flat and sun and moon didn't exist in the um, early, or in the years of the trees part of the first age. And in that, it should have been always night. And Sometimes he kind of indicates that it was always night, but in some cases he also talks about dawn and so on. You could maybe construct a theory in saying when he talks about dawn or something, he means like a certain star constellation um, being seen or so. So you can basically decide different daytimes based on um, that. And not only dawn in um, like Amman, because in Amman we had the two trees of Valinor and uh, the two trees of Valinor, of course, had like a, a, a day and night, you could say almost something like a day and night cycle. <laughs> okay. So yeah, the, the uh, the Valar discarded Middle Earth. Kind, not really. They at least sent some help. If they, you mean like if they didn't care about Middle Earth, um, too much. If that makes sense, like it often feels like they cared a bit less about Middle Earth, but. I know, I think they're just very hesitant and let things be. Like, it's a complicated, it's a very complicated topic, I feel. I mean, later they at least sent the East study to Middle-earth to, to kind of help men against the evil forces like Sauron and his um, servants, but... And there was also the War of Ras. So I wouldn't say they, not fully, but maybe sometimes you could argue they should have cared a bit more, for sure. Yeah, the eagles kept an eye on things. That's also a good argument. Like the um, great eagles that we... I don't know, do I have a great eagle screenshot somewhere? They are servants of Manwe, the king of the Valar, and uh, he for sure... Um, like, when the eagles know, he knows as well, I guess. And we maybe type this. Now I have a typo and don't find the eagle. So what do we have eagle-wise available here? This shot is from The Hobbit. I would argue The Hobbit shot is probably the best one. One of my favorite um, screenshots from the film. Should be from the first film. Yeah, of course it must be. So yeah, that is from Unexpected Journey, which we might watch um, next week, by the way. So I said 7th of January. Currently, there is no conflicting um, appointment for me on the 7th. So um, Saturday, the 7th of January 2023, we watch An Unexpected Journey at some point, probably. If you look at your clock right now, subtract seven hours, then some, some, something around that time we might start. Because 
it's also over three hours long, I think, in the extended edition. And if we start so late again, then a lot of people might not be able to watch it or stay that long. It would be unfortunate. So yeah, something like this, in case uh, people wonder. <laughs> Only count 13 while the 14th eagle. Maybe behind a rock. <laughs> Or maybe one eagle transports two people. Wait, it should be 15. You're right, there's only 13 um, eagles there. But I could imagine, uh, like I said, somebody is maybe still further behind, or maybe some uh, one eagle, like two eagles transport two people, then it would, I think, fit again, right? Yeah, it's, it's true, the perfect image 17. Uh, the Vala seemed sometimes to not care that much about men. That for sure. I feel like they care so much about the elves, but men, yeah, let them, let them do their stuff. We don't care. It often feels a bit like this. So chat, since um, the question amount is slightly reduced in chat, uh, wasn't Bilbo holding onto Dory's legs? That is possible. Like if you like one eagle in particular looks like the feet are a bit the feet are a bit prolonged. Does that makes sense. Or maybe there's a second one, but I can't remember. We we let's <laughs> I suggest we look at this. Um, next stream when we have next week when we watch the this particular scene in the film in the um yeah unexpected journey uh, the hobbit an unexpected journey the first hobbit film i can't be, it can't be uh, like it's hard to believe that it's from 2012 it feels kind of closer than 2012 but it's like 10 years ago like, <laughs> like the first film came out a decade ago oh boy good times chad a decade ago just imagine I had this YouTube channel. Well, I had this YouTube channel. No, I had. I I didn't have. In 2012, I did not have this YouTube channel yet. It's 2013. Next year in May or June or something, I have 10 years anniversary. So it must be 2013. Oh, my poor legs. Oh, my poor arms rings a bell. <laughs> yeah. I have to admit, I'm kind of looking forward to um, the Hobbit first Hobbit film. I like it, I think, of the three Hobbit films the most. The second I like least, I think, though it's kind of tough with the third one. Like, the second and the th third are not my favorite Hobbit films, let's put it that way. So I look less forward to them, though they have also um, some stuff. Uh, congrats, how will you celebrate? That's a good question, to be honest. I have no idea, like I'm really bad at celebrating um, anniversaries on my channel. Usually you would make some, maybe make a live stream and answer Tolkien questions, <laughs> basically the same as we do today. <laughs> maybe I make a super cut of my best and most funny log moments or so. Sometimes I um, save some of my outtakes, but I don't have many. Though there, there would be a million of them, but in theory, um, there are sometimes funny outtakes as well. Maybe you make like something like that, just to celebrate the 10 years anniversary of this channel. Maybe make a little history video with some outtakes or so. 
Like, this is how my channel started. This was a terrible video. I had no idea how stuff works. Also, you uh, forgot a dot somewhere. R.S. Aurelian. Oh. <laughs> you you posted um, the file name and the, the bot thinks, hmm, some name with a dot and then another word must be a domain or something. And then he instantly times you out. Unfortunately, I can't make the... Um, make the bot less aggressive about um, posting links. It's, it's a bit annoying, I have to admit, with the, um, uh, with, with the bot consistently seeing everything where um, a space is missing as a, as a, as a URL and, and purging the person. But the, the, for, the advantage is if somebody wants to post a link, he can ask and I can give him permission. If I do this over the YouTube link stuff, which might work better, I think. Like, um, I think the YouTube link stuff at least checks if this is an existing top-level domain, which the Streamlabs bot doesn't. Um, in that case, I uh, can't give people um, permission to do that. I have to admit, though, I forgot the permission um, link for that. But, yeah. Can I unperch you? That would be great. Mm -hmm. No, I think I can't. Can I post a link? Wait a moment. I need to give you permission to do that. The problem is I forgot the command <laughs> because I'm an idiot, but... I think it's, it's uh, exclamation mark permit or so. Yeah, yeah, permit it should be. So I would... Let's test it out. Yeah, you have to permission to post the link and it only lasts for 60 seconds or so. So you have to, I'm not sure what, to what number I set the permit. One hundred twenty seconds even, okay. May your bait grow ever longer, the polite thing to say to a dwarf. Yeah, that's true. Uh, thanks for such a lovely time. I'm s uh, sorry, love, that I've spaced out. Guess um, I'm at my limit. Need to pop out. Love to see you. Yeah, thank you for staying so long, Reflective Rambling. Much, much appreciated. As always, to seeing you here. And uh, staying so long with us. Also moderating. Thank you for that. Much, much appreciated. Thank you for your two um, memberships that you gifted. Probably to some people who are just um, spacing out in the background, um, lurking in the background. But um, yeah, welcome to those again. Mary Korahonen and uh, Norway. Noah is interestingly the actual name of Kirdan, for people wondering. But yeah, we'll, we, I will also end the stream relatively uh, soon, I feel. <laughs> waiting for the Hobbit extended watch party with Maya-like anticipation. Anticipation. Um, yeah, I'm. I'm also curious how um, how the f how the episode will. Oh, Noah is here. <laughs> so welcome, Noah. Nice to see you as well. Anyway, great New Year's Eve to everyone. Guten Rutsch ins Neue <laughs> to, to the Germans here, yeah. Slide, slide well in the new year, as we say in German. Like it's well, translated by word. Um, oh, Third Age um, on the PlayStation 2. That was a very interesting game, I think. Was that the 
I always mix them up a little bit. Was that the um, turn-based um, RPG? I think it was, right? Yeah, that was a very interesting one. Shadow of War is also good. I like Shadow of Mordor a bit more. Battle for Middle-earth is also pretty good. Uh, I missed the Lord of Rings watch party, so I guess I have to watch The Hobbit now. Yeah, for those people who want to watch, um, the vote said we will um, watch the watch party. We will watch the watch party, yeah, but you know what I mean. <laughs> we will watch the watch party in the extended edition. Let me just see if I can... Ha I, have, I even have the poll here. Let me just zoom in a bit so we can maybe see my rambling here a bit better. The poll says with... I, I, to be honest, I didn't expect the um, the outcome to be so clear because I would have assumed that the extended edition of the Hobbit films is a little bit less popular in a way because it's simply the films are less popular and so on. And maybe people didn't buy or bother getting the extended edition. But to be honest, it's kind of surprising that 33% um, said, no, we don't want Hobbit content at all. That's the most surprising for me. Like the theatrical cut, okay. But um, yeah, but 64% says let's watch the Hobbit f films in the extended edition. So that's kind of impressive, I have to admit. Yeah, Mountain Blade Warb Warband had also like a really nice uh, mod that's pretty nice. But yeah, that was a vote on my YouTube channel. In case you are looking for the vote, maybe you want to still change the outcome, of course, by no illegal means, um, but by simply putting your vote onto the table. Um, putting your vote onto the table, whatever. Um, that is the link to the channel. Posted it in chat, so you can vote there if you want. Let's now see potentially um, the the difference in time when I posted this and when you hear this. There's definitely for sure some delay here for some people. Um, have you ever thought about Tolkien's multiple use of the word fell, fell voices, fell uh, meat, fell beast, troll fell and so on? Um, at least it definitely is noticeable Tolkien kinds of like to use it. I think um, the word uh, fell, like if, if we, for example, think of the fell beasts, which um, is, in my opinion, a um, very interesting one. It's like an old, uh, an archaic English word for like dread. And I wouldn't be surprised, like fell could totally be an, um, a Germanic word in origin. I've never checked this, to be honest, but from this perspective, it would make complete sense. Let me see. Verb, noun, noun, adjective, probably what we're looking for. Yeah, it's old, uh, Middle English, Old English. It means cruel, savage, fierce. Feel, feel, oh, that's hard to say. Fale. Fale. Something like this. Very curious. Does it exist in modern German uh, thing? Only in um, German, in, in low German. That means rash and thrift. Old Friesen, Fall, rule. Very interesting. But yeah, I think that's why Tolkien potentially liked it. As a noun, it can also mean like um, animal skin or so. In German, we have the word still like hide or skin of, a, of an animal is called, um, not hide, but the hairy fur of an animal is called fell in German. But it's a different word origin of this. In Danish it exists as as well. I'm sure uh, fell. 
Well, something like this. I'm I always trouble with the air uh, sound. Hi, German. Very, very interesting word. Exists in Latin as well. Interesting. Foul beast, yeah. Potentially. Yeah, fell has a lot of meanings. It's a very cool word. Yeah, it's potentially a vocal shift. Definitely a possibility here. So it seems to exist um, in its uh, as, as an um, adjective. Middle English fell. Old English. It also existed in Old English as a fell. But also as um, like with the A and the E in one letter, the A uh, sound. Only in compounds. That is interesting. It seems like you only find in compound words. Bloodthirsty would be a uh, well fell in Old English. It Alfellor, evil, baleful, Alfella, very dire, very interesting. Lucian Dunn, the fell of the vampire in the text. That is also an interesting point, yeah. Maybe that's a word Tolkien really liked because it has so many different meanings. Very interesting. It's a, it's a very interesting word, though. I agree with you there. Yeah, for sure. It's similar in German at times when the well, shift stuff happens. Though in English, it's often complicated. Very evident in me not knowing how to pronounce words in English a lot of times. But yeah, it's always um, a very difficult in this regard. Baron don't the hame of the wolf in the text also means skin, yeah. Hame is also a pretty cool word. I agree on that. For example, Gandalf Greyhame. I have to admit, Tolkien was pretty good with some, some names. Not gonna lie. Grey cloak, which would have been um, oh, I'm not sure how it's pronounced. It's a G at the end. It could be in this case, it could be a grey, greyhama. I'm not. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's not greyhama. Oh wait, it's a philosopher's stream, <laughs> thus we shall solve this right now and the stream will last another eight hours. No. See, even my grandma is failing me. Good night, yeah. I wish you a good night, Mr. Man. Thank you for staying so long. I'm impressed you are still uh, have the energy to stream. I think you are um, in the same time zone as me where it's, it's very late. 
Uh, I have not much strength and now I must uh, slumber uh, <laughs> in the deep. Thank you for the good time. Yeah, thank you for staying for so long. Yeah, it's indeed very late. The problem is my uh, currently my uh, day night rhythm sleeping rhythm is completely destroyed. So currently I slowly getting tired as well, but I could definitely go on for some time. It's very early, not late anymore. That's true. Wanted to wish every uh, everyone a happy new year, uh, a happy happy New Year's end. But then realized it's not a thing in English, unlike in German or Estonian. Well, that's yeah, that's always confused me as well. Always want to wish people yeah have a nice transition from this year into the next year. But um, there's no like guten Rutsch or something like we say in German. So it's kind of funny that that is. I assume not that of a thing in English, and you just wait till it's next year. We Germans are impatient in this regard and want to wish you, give you our well wishes early already. Yeah, Happy New Year, MVV Trixie But yeah, also to Pumpkin Rick and so on. All of you have a nice transition to the next year. Mithrandir, yeah. Also a pretty cool name, I have to admit. Mithrandia is also one of my favorite elvish names or something or of somebody. I don't know why it I think it has a very cool sound to it. It wasn't a uh, Graham um Der um, derogatory um, term given to Grim uh, to, by Grima. No, that was I think um, like Grima called him ill news, um, last last spell, which is hard for me to sell. Uh, say, a uh, gray pilgrim means Mithrandir. I think it's um, Graham is I think what um, Eomer um, calls him. Gandalf, Eomer exclaimed, Gandalf Graham is known in the mark, but his name, I warn you, is no longer a password to the king's favor. He has been a guest in the land many times in the memory of men, coming as he will after a season or after many years. He is ever the herald of strange events, a bringer of evil, some now say. So, yeah. It seems like a general, like known, like he's known as Greyhay. Maybe it is, like it means grey cloak or something like this, because he's like a person that comes in a grey cloak. <laughs> Let's face it, if, if, if Chris had to be one of the East study, he had have walked into the library of mysterious hence he wasn't seen again by mortal eyes. Yeah, that could have... Uh, <laughs> that's, that's true. That sounds true though, yeah. Uh, might have been. No, I i am very bad at like uh, memorizing text passages completely, especially poems and so on. I'm very good at like finding stuff because I'm... I usually there's one... Like how I memorize stuff to find it fast in, in books, especially if I have the digital version of the book. I usually memorize like one significant small phrase of like two or three words and then I find it fast and can read it. But I'm very bad at memorizing complete texts. I don't know why that is, but um, so I can't um, quote, for example, the Gilgalad po poem out of my memory, even though I've read it many times. I'm not really good at learning um, poems. <laughs> I memorized the poem a couple of months ago. Now I can recite it um, while I'm driving. Gilgalad was an elven king. Yeah. Gandalf, really awesome by far. Yeah, Gandalf is also a pretty cool name. I like the character, of course. Such a iconic character. And um, I don't know, he's just. I would say um, 
like in the classical big popular franchises of our time with Lord of the Rings, but if we would also include Star Wars, I think um, he's up there with Yoda or something. So, And in a way, potentially... Lucas was also a bit inspired by Tolkien's writing uh, to some extent. I made a video about this some years ago. Like in a very early version of um, the script for a new for the first Star Wars film, new, that was later titled A New Hope, I think. The beginning was just called Star Wars. Um, there's a passage that is originally the um, good morning passage from um, The Hobbit. Just with Obi-Wan and Luke or... He was at this point not uh, it's not called Skywalker, but um, Starkiller, I think. <laughs> Good morning, said Bilbo, and he mended. The sun was shining and the grass was very green. I guess this he led. Wait, what do you mean? He said. Do you wish me a good morning, or mean that it is a good morning, whether I want it or not, or that it feels good this morning, or that it is a morning to be good on? All the same at once, said Bilbo. I think this particular passage um, was in the script as well, just with different names. But he, due to copyright, fearing copyright reasons and so on, he um, removed it. But it's kind of interesting. Um, <laughs> that very early script of Star Wars this was also in it. So Tolkien, uh, to Christ, um, <laughs> George Lucas is his name, um, for sure had uh, <laughs> read uh, at least The Hobbit. And of course, like there's another book called um, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, and that speaks about the monomyth. And um, in an interview, uh, Lucas also quotes that. And I assume in mythology. Like, it's a very lot of mythology elements you also find in Star Wars, so it kind of makes sense that there are parallels to Tolkien, who also wrote with a very much mythology approach, when that make, if that makes sense. <laughs> Actually, I'm really good at that sort of thing. I have more Tolkien poems memorized than I'm willing to admit. No, actually, I'm willing to admit that. I memorized most of them because that's sick. That's actually really sick. But I'm very bad at memorizing texts, especially by word. Like, I always need my book and I can find stuff fast and reread it again and hopefully answer questions. I usually am very good at memorizing what is written, you know, like a lot of details and half sentences and stuff. And so I can make these streams easily out of my head a lot of time and tell you what it is. And then I memorize two words or so that I memorized along with what was written in the book and I can just find it and read the, the passage to you. It doesn't work always, but sometimes it works. Obi-Wan fell so Luke could be um, the hero alone. Gandalf fell so Frodo could be the hero alone, yeah. I only memorized um, the Durin uh, poem, which is quite long, but um, I like it a lot. A film the harpers that we th uh, sing, yeah. It's the second line. I think. Though in a strange way, I often memorize the stuff that is important for answering certain law questions, if that makes sense. Like, I have a topic of a video, and I know in the poem there is... Um, there are some interesting mentions of um, how Gilgalad potentially looked and so on. So that is detail. <laughs> um, I have to memorize. Now, his sword was long, his lens was keen, his shining helm far was seen. The countless stars of heaven's shield were mirrored in a silver shield. So we, we learn he had a sword, he had a shield, it's silver, it's reflected, and so on and so forth. Pretty cool. <laughs> I 
this dream goes ever on and on there. Yeah, that would be my the poem I should write. But yeah, we are now at four and a half hours. I feel like I answered a lot of um, fantastic questions and it was a lot of fun today. We streamed last week as well, but I felt like um, since currently I'm a bit slow on working on my um, on my next law video, I just said, let's make another stream, have a nice evening with the nice people that um, often come by and visit my channel and have a good time together here in the, in the stream. Discussing the law and answering um, fantastic uh, uh, law questions and go into quite a bit of detail reading some text that Tolkien wrote which is always amazing and maybe expand a bit the horizon maybe learn something new like that in some version Ninja was the chief ring of the three not Vilja so that is kind of fascinating completely forgot about this detail very uh, interesting but yeah, that was um, a pretty nice stream, you people. I, of course, have not rendered um, the credits in the background again, though I'm also not sure if I have to, depending on what tier was gifted today. Oh, it's just two fully things. Even have to would add, have to add this to the video. I also have to add Birchman. Let me just open. Adobe Premiere in the background and try to um, not get to stuttering too much while doing something that's completely unrelated to what I'm actually doing. Thanks. Enjoyed the show. May your um, AV receive you uh, at day's end. I hope so too. Yeah, very curious what next year is going on on this channel. Um, well, it's not too surprising that there will be law videos on this channel. Uh, surprise. Um... I don't expect a new season of Rings of Power, so we should be relatively Rings of Power free next year, I think. And with that, um, for those... Uh, for those wondering, so... We should, for those who didn't like the show, um, I wanted to say um, this uh, might be good news in a way. So I still um, kind of uh, miss this stuff. And Priscilla TV is in it. Okay, that's good. So let me just put our new subscribers into the uh, credits. Let me just see. Reflective Rambling is in the credits, right? Because the gifter, of course, also I put them in the credits. And Birchman, I need to... Uh, include as well. I think I forgot him last time. He uh, subscribed on Twitch. So if, some, if somebody wants to get a channel membership and be in the credits of the show, you have like five seconds to <laughs> get this done. If not, you have to wait till um, the 7th, I assume, of January when the next stream will be. I hope I get a law video done in the meantime, but I have to admit my laziness currently um, knows no limits. So, um... It's a bit unfortunate, I feel, but what can I do, right? Sometimes you need to relax a little bit, and I relaxed quite a bit um, just recently. And yeah, as I said, shoutouts again to all uh, the people getting a subscription. To to add to the um, subscription part, you have to get at least for streaming credits a tier 2 subscription or a tier 3 for also video credits, just for people wondering if ever wanted to be laziness. Yeah. Great stream. Good night, Chris. Yeah, thank you, um, Fifi. Nice to you like the stream. Uh, this was a really intense year, I have to admit. Like, I worked a lot this year. I think I never worked that, m that much in my life. Especially in these, um, in these, like, eight weeks or, let's say, three months with the trailer analysis stuff and so on. Like, that was let's say, a very free time, um, less, uh, yeah, uh, have very little free time in this, in these months. So that was kind of intense.
Yeah, I agree on that. Like, I felt it was a really good year. Like I said, it was probably the best. Uh, no, it's probably it was the best year I had on my channel. I think I had the most watched hours on this channel I've ever seen. That's really impressive. I would just love if the views would just go up and my subscriber numbers would just go up a little bit further. That I would appreciate quite a bit. And maybe we can achieve this next year. I w it would be great to see 50k next year. Or maybe even more than 50k. But, um, yeah, sometimes, um, <laughs> sometimes you don't get what you want. That's basically, um, the problem with it. So let me just render this here. I hope I didn't do any mistakes. Oh, I did a mistake. The mistake was called, I spelled Birchman wrong. Let me just, where's my thing so I can copy the name. That is Birchman42. Shout outs to you, man. Last time I wanted to shout out you at least. I forgot even that because I'm an idiot. But it happens. Um, the best, I guess. Now I have to rename the file again. Awesome. Uh, that should work. Export. So, yeah, that is um, what uh, will be happening next year with my production tab here it is and yeah this brings us at the end of the stream there will be of course more law streams in the future as you can imagine and uh, we will discuss more law there i guess is this alfred hitchcock's outline no um this it's in kind of inspired by um the alfred hitchcock logo he made and uh, it's not that though it's i think because i'm the philosopher i took like um a statue of a philosopher i think it was um, a greek statue of socrates and kind of inspired um that from from that and that is how this particular uh thing came to be in case you uh, wonder so let's see if the credits now work seems like it works so yeah, uh, shout outs to all uh, the supporters again. Um, if you like this video and watch this as a VOD. There's a there's also Aristoteles and so there are multiple statues. I took one where I found like an image f with a perfect profile that I could draw kind of along. But I, 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 I let um, the, the, away the beard. Whatever, it's not that important. Yeah, good night and um, have, a, have a good transition into the next year. I wish you a fantastic um, year 2023 when we will reach it. And I hope you have a good year. It was a tough year 2022. Again, shout outs to all the artists um, that allowed me to use the artworks. Uh, no, the Sinker is a very specific statue, the one um, you took uh, nighty night. Okay, and um, yeah, um, the, it's, it, it's a, it was a tough year for a lot of people. I hope next year gets better. Uh, fingers crossed. <laughs> and yeah, for the channel, it was a fantastic year. I hope I can keep up with this year next year. That's a bit uh, of my worry that this year due to the Rings of Power boost stuff, um, worked out pretty well at the end but overall it was a really tough year for me it started really like number wise not that well at the beginning of the year and took me quite some time to um, bring the numbers back to where they once were and there was a bit was quite frustrating year as a result i worked had to work a lot to make that happen and uh yeah in the end it worked out but i would like wish a more relaxing year that is a bit more smooth so far stuff on the channel runs smooth so i have to admit very happy with that. Uh, next year, I will try to most likely, except for streams, because I don't see the benefit of streaming in 4K resolution. I will, um, law videos and stuff might appear in 4K resolution. I already started with this. Who is Elrond though? The last, uh, all the episodes will be in 1080p though, because I produced everything in 1080p and I want to make one big all-in-one video out of it. And then changing um, the resolution of 
nine hours of video that is already produced is just a nightmare of work. So I don't want to do that. That's why that will stay in 1080p. But uh, Galadriel, I might um, up uh, the next Galadriel video will be produced in 4K. So just that you know about this technical stuff, upgrade a bit of my art run. So this year was pretty neat. And yeah, as said, if you watch this as a VOD, press the like button, maybe subscribe if you are new and welcome, much appreciated. Leave a comment and so on on the other videos. Check out my other stuff. Um, I hope I can produce a few more videos. I also plan next year to do more stuff on the German channel because the German channel did pretty well this year considering that I only have like five videos or so on it. Um, it did pretty well, I have to admit, and um, yeah, surpassed my expectations by far, which is pretty good. So that kind of tells me I should maybe invest more time also on this channel. Would like to do some gaming content as well, but as you probably notice, when you do a lot of lore content, I don't have time to make gaming content, but there's that. Even though it's very late, as said, my sleeping scale is ruined anyway, I might look a little bit into cyberpunk again to maybe try around with some build stuff. So I might continue on Twitch for like an hour or two. And um, then before I call it a day. So uh, if you like some gaming content or so, maybe check the Twitch channel uh, as well, which yeah, I don't know, maybe I'm live in a few minutes. Maybe I decide against it. Something like that. No, that is wrong. That's, I think, how I spell it. Um, yeah, link is in chat in case you're interested, but give me a moment to, <laughs> to set the stream up. Um, yeah, there I might continue and uh, we just experiment a bit with some builds or so. Maybe we make another run in whatever game. I don't know. There's still some stuff I want to uh, continue with on the gaming channel and use the time a bit, my laziness time bit to play some video games. Won't start a new game today, though, I guess, but who knows. Um, is there anything left to say, chat? I don't think so. So, again, as said, fantastic um, transition to the new year and have a great year 2023. Fingers crossed that it will be a good year. Thank you for watching. For all your support, shoutouts to all your people. It was really fun today. And good night to those who finally have to go to sleep. So, see you people next time. Goodbye.